There was once a great man of sound mind and temperament who had great dreams of protecting his people from evil and building a great society that would enrich and enlighten all mankind. His fatal flaw was his crippling inability to admit he didn't know everything, that he was afraid. That man's name was Magnus, one of the most tortured souls I have ever encountered. Storm, Black Panther, Volume 2, Number 27. This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1881, Spotlight on Magneto, the Master of Magnetism. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Ian Levenstein. I'm Chris Eberly. Ah, uh, and there we are, folks. Welcome to this uh, very attractive new uh, spotlight episode. <laughs> yes, of everything, Geek Speak. everything looks better when the camera angle is up. Chins yes, up. yes, and, and even even my iPad is tracking me no matter where I go here because it's got it's one of those new ones that has like the centering thing, so I I always look like I'm I'm centered in camera. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've got kind of a bird's eye view thing happening on us here because the the camera is kind of drooping on the mic stand on which it's currently positioned. So the the viewer is looking up at you, Ian, and down on the rest of us. I'm looking up at the sky. It's beautiful outside. <laughs> It's cloudy with a chance of meatballs and a high of 83. <laughs> and as the listeners no doubt can have gathered, we are in studio. At least three out of four of us are in studio. It's a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> L. Levinson is joining us from his sojourn in Florida. Honored in, for joining us, sir. Indeed, uh, my pleasure. From an undisclosed location somewhere in between <laughs> Orlando and Tampa. <laughs> So uh, we were hoping to get together uh, during the holidays when everybody hopefully has more time. And uh, I was hoping to do a spotlight. And I want to e emphasize that I got this idea from a poll the listeners did on, on uh, the Facebook page not too long ago where they were asking for new spotlight topics. And one of the suggestions that really struck me was Magneto, who is one of the most important characters in the whole Marvel Universe, I would I would argue. Magneto. Mm -hmm. God, I missed you. <laughs> that rapey wit. And, and furthermore, wah, wah. Um, a very important fig figure in, in the movie universe. I'm sure he's going to appear in the future. MCU, I would imagine. Oh, without question. Yep. Um, yep. And a very complex character. And, you know, as I returned to this research, I almost forgot how complicated Magneto is, which made some of the research a little challenging at times. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into all that. But you know, thanks to the listeners for that poll, and I realized how remiss I was in not doing a spotlight on, on this utterly important figure. So, Absolutely. really looking forward to talking about this. And the fact that we're here together, <laughs> basking in holiday fellowship. Indeed. <laughs> Too bad I didn't bring the eggnog. <laughs> but, you know, Murd got us <laughs> and the wonderful uh, yeah. peanut butter. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Pennsylvania Dutch favorite, uh, the oh, peanut butter incredible. blossom cookie. Incredible. Ooh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> you don't get any. <laughs> hey. You know, it's, it's, it's fine. I've been I've been eating uh, Frango chocolates from Marshall Fields in Chicago all week because Macy's had a sale. So we've been we had them delivered here. So it, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm chocolate it out. <laughs> Ian, why don't you remind the listeners why we're so grateful to them? Indeed. Yep. We are indeed grateful for you guys, especially at the end of this uh, this year. Uh, for an entire year of support over at patreon.com slash comic geek speak. Uh, you guys have been amazing uh, keeping uh, the, the donations coming for as little as a dollar a month. And we really, really do appreciate anything that you can do to keep the show running. Um, and uh, as we enter 2023, we have you guys to thank. So patreon.com slash comic geek speak for that. Uh, or the old school donations at comic geek slash donate.php. We get the PayPal still available there. Or just shoot us an iTunes review or let a, let a friend know. We have an amazing uh, 
thankful email I'll be reading on the next comic talk from one of our listeners who decided to uh, let us know how much he was thankful for us this past year. And I really do appreciate that. Um, and patreon.com slash comic timing. If you want to get in on, uh, on, uh, supporting me and my, you know, production of this show and other shows, uh, most recent comic timing currently on the CGS feed. So three and a half hours of goodness there before we knew it, it was three and a half hours. And I'm not quite sure how that happened, but, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for any way you support the show. Blink of an eye. And we should yep. emphasize the support allows us to be in the studio right now where we can gather and nothing beats podcasting in person. So. Fantastic. Well, Murd, I wanted to emphasize, first of all, the fact that you concocted a storm centric accent reading of the opening to this episode. <laughs> uh, Murd always... noted, of course, that, you know, when you go back to Storm's parentage, Aurora was born, had American parents, but raised in Cairo and then in uh, Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think so. Anyway. I, I, you know, to my, to my untuned ear, he got it all. So I couldn't yeah. be happier in person. <laughs> <laughs> Not all at once necessarily, but <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen. So Magneto. Now I want to start by saying this was a delight to research. And it reminded me of how much I love this character, how much this character has had an effect on me, and also how complex this character is. And one thing we'll talk about throughout is there's really different Magnetos. Like, mm -hmm. I think, like, when you look at Dr. Doom, for example, like, he's the other, like, really big bad, of course, in Marvel. I, I argue he's more or less consistent throughout his history. I mean, there's always embellishments and things they're adding, mm -hmm. but it's it's pretty much Doom. Yep. And anything that doesn't and, fit the mold, they can blame on a Doom bot. Yes, exactly. Right. Whereas, as I was researching and reading old stories or, or, or snippets of old stories, the Lee Kirby Magneto of the Silver Age is basically a different character, I would argue, than the Chris Claremont Magneto. And it's, it was fascinating to see that contrast, and I'll, we'll talk about that as we move along. But this this research was, was and again, if I'd had more time, I sure would have come up with even more, but this research was challenging, in part because I'm well-versed in X-Men from the beginning through the end of the Claremont era where, where Ian jumped on X-Men 1. Mm -hmm. Was it 91 or 92? Uh, 91, right? Yeah, 91, yeah. yeah. And I read X-Men for quite a long time after that, too. But I, you know what I've come to realize just in this research and re reading some other recent just older X-Men stuff? With some very notable exceptions for me as a reader, the, the, that, that title in the universe has not held up for me since Claremont left the book. I realize that now more and more. Um, and I think Magneto is very much an emblematic of that as you get into the post claremont work i mean we'll talk about zorn of course which is a whole <laughs> no <laughs> you have to mention it but um yeah. so th th this was this is a fast i think we take a fascinating ride in a marvel history here with with this with this character so uh first impressions ian what's your first memories of magneto so my, my i mean my first impressions of magneto uh kind of come from x-men the, the animated series of course. uh because that's that's really where i started you know dipping my my toe into the x-men world and Magneto was such an integral part of that series. Uh, they, yeah. they, they, they took not only from the, you know, the Jim Lee 91, but also all the other older X-Men series that wound up getting uh, uh, adapted only in an animated series style, like all the Savage Land stuff and, and him roaming around with, uh, with uh, Professor Xavier and what have you. And uh, just, it, I, 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 I got to know a character that was very um layered you know he he wasn't just a megalon megmaniacal maniac you know he wasn't like just a i want to destroy all humans he he had a purpose for his for his existence uh you know he had a very different idea of what you, human relations was going to be than what professor xavier had but it wasn't quite evil and then getting to know later on you know years after not not quite years after that but get, getting to know his his jewish heritage getting to know the fact that uh that you know he was in the holocaust getting to know the you know the, the romani elements of it of, of it all uh i mean there's been confusing elements oh yeah we'll get into that <laughs> but, he, but nevertheless his time in the holocaust uh it really just builds the character 
and also builds the sliding co- time scale, which I'm sure we'll also get into because my God, at this point, uh, they, they actually try to address that with with the baby period, which we'll talk about as well. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, a very but, strange but, but, story that everybody at Marvel is very happy happened. <laughs> But but I I, I I I appreciate Magneto for what he is. It's fascinating to see what he's become because he's much more on the side of the X Men now than he ever was before. Uh, that could easily change in three seconds. But he's he's not quite a villain, and that's what makes him so damn cool. Now, do you think that he's on the side of the X Men, or have the X Men come more on his side? Oh, good question, Shane. Very good question, yeah. Shane. I think it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B, most definitely. Depends on the time period you're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. But we've, we've seen both. We've seen both examples. Yep. Yeah. Recently, yeah. I think it's been more B than A. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Murder, your first impression. Uh, Matt's Marvel yes. Universe Series 1 trading cards. <laughs> I feel better. Go ahead. Okay, Continuity. just exchange money now, folks. Uh, whoever had that in the pool. you know. <laughs> Everybody take a drink. That's You're it. Playing the favorite, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it's, it's not just Magneto's own card in that series either, but I, I think there might have been like famous first appearances cards in that, in that set. Featuring the image of X-Men Volume 1, Number 1, with Magneto in that Kirby image off in the lower left, facing off against the X-Men, yep. swinging, running, flying in from the other side. Um, and also, there were a couple of uh, famous team-up cards in that series, and it showed, and a couple of them involved Magneto. I think there was a Magneto and Doctor Doom team-up card, and a Magneto and Red Skull card. I remember that uh, I was I was kind of impressed in, in this you know, early exposure of mine to you know the Marvel Universe in general. How many of those villain team ups involved mind control or blackmail or just some <laughs> kind of coercion to show you how little honor there was among thieves and demagogues and such. Um, so, yeah, there was that. And there was also the uh, X-Men arcade game that Matt and I spent so many happy hours playing. Ah, uh, yes. Um, Super Nintendo. Uh, no, the arcade game, the actual coin okay. up. Wow! Because the the, the uh, Regis Arcade in Stone Harbor had one, okay. and so I usually played Nightcrawler. Matt was Wolverine more often than not, and just we just yeah. went to town. And Magneto was there. Yes, he was. And yes, I, I also share Ian's exposure to the X Men animated series. I still remember Magneto's first line of dialogue there with just a hint of a European accent. What are you waiting for? <laughs> As he attempted <laughs> to break, uh, I think it was Beast out of prison, and Beast politely declined. Yep. Just stay there because he thought that his escaping would do the mutant cause more harm than good. Mm. It's kind of an early and a somewhat understated example of the differences in philosophy between the X-Men and Magneto, even in the animated milieu. Yep. Shaney Pooh? Um, I want to say it was probably similar to Ian's, where it was the animated series and X-Men number one from the early 90s that did it, because that was, that was my introduction to X-Men and reading them. Uh, I was going to the store at that time it was called comics and more in king of prussia and the guy anthony behind the counter introduced me to it and he he was really good at uh explaining and a resource for where to go and what to look up so uh that's kind of where i started with x-men and and magneto in particular all right uh ian would you put up the x-men number one cover please uh which x-men number one the silver age volume one sorry i should have clarified to correct sir i was remiss yep excellent so there we go my first exposure to Magneto, well, my first conscious exposure that I recall is this story in my fabled Son of Origins copy, uh, which I've <laughs> Fireside Editions many times on this program. Again, Stanley's version of, of events of how the Marvel characters were originated. And Son of Origins featured the X Men. And <clears throat> I knew nothing about the X Men. I may have picked up a random issue or two and spinner racks that my parents got me prior to this, but this is my first memory of reading X-Men story. And again, what an introduction and Magneto. I remember thinking as a kid, how cool he looks. I loved his helmet. Uh, I love the look and you know, his powers were interesting and that was about the sum of it. And then my other memory, and especially cause I rekindled last night watching it and Shane will appreciate this is probably being exp- exposed to Magneto on the Spider-Man cartoons in 1981. Sure, sure. Both the solo Spider-Man series. And then was it coming out concurrently, Amazing Spider-Man's Amazing Friends at the same time? Because they come out in the same year. Um, gosh, I only remember Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends at that time. Okay. And then other Spider-Mans around it before and after. Maybe that's the case. But both series had a Magneto. I forgot about that. Yeah, so that, that was probably where I yeah. first saw him. But so, I mean, the they don't eye. mention the X-Men in those particular stories, but um so that was my first impression and then as we're going to discuss 
as I started to collect X-Men back issues and read more about the different characters, I started to realize that Magneto is, is especially when Claremont gets his hands on him and Cochran and Byrne, is a really complex villain. And as Ian was saying, and especially as they develop the character, you start to, whether you like it or not, see things from his perspective. And you can start to understand, in some cases, even almost sympathize mm-hmm. with some of the things he's, he believes and the things he's doing. So this is a character who, because he's rooted in history, because he's rooted in, in the Holocaust and, and the Second World War and what follows, there's a lot to discuss. You know, there's like a lot of meat on the bone when it comes to, to this character. So, John, I'm looking forward to diving in. And by, and by the way, Chris, that was when Magneto Speaks, People Listen uh, from October 17th, 1981. <laughs> the uh, season one, episode six episode of that Spider-Man animated series in the 80s. And I have an Ian, I'm actually going to impress you because I actually have some of these notes uh, when it comes to this type of thing. Usually I'm, I'm hopeless. But um, <laughs> and then Spider-Man is Amazing Friends. Episode seven aired on Halloween 1981. Nice. Ah. The prison plot. And I'll read I'll read the, the summary because it's perfect. Magneto seizes East Coast power supply and threatens to destroy Earth unless his brotherhood is released. And they show the blob, the toad and mastermind in their respective prison cells. So, nice. <laughs> That, those are early Magneto exposures. Mm-hmm. So, oh, one further note about uh, early impressions uh, for Matt and myself: uh, we always pronounce the character's name Magneto. I think oh, a yeah? lot of people have done that. Yeah, and one of them years. was Jack Kirby, is the thing. So, anyone out there <laughs> left right. who is uh, is not on the long E bandwagon here, uh, just know that there's one very influential person in Magneto's past who's still mm-hmm. in that corner. But yeah, then the animated series of the '90s came along, and that kind of became definitive even for Matt and, and for myself. So, it's been Magneto to us ever since. Just for people at home, this moment right now when Murd stepped in with that magnificent <laughs> nugget of information, mm-hmm. I, I'm just I'm home. Like I, I'm so happy yeah. to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and of course, and of course, Murd. Now that you said it, it, it makes me think there's probably people out there who thought that Wolverine was supposed to be Australian, thanks to <laughs> Pride of the Oh Africa. yes, care for a oh, piece yes. of fruit. I, I I did for years. I I thought he was Australian. Oh my god! Actually, let me ask this question. Ian gave, gave me a nice introduction for it. You're referring mm. to Pride of the X Men, right? Yes. Okay, I tried to watch because I've never seen that. Yeah. Um, is that it? Wasn't on Disney Plus? No, it's not. Uh, it, it's you might be able to find it on YouTube because I think okay. that's where I found it originally. Um, it's a it's essentially a quote unquote unair pilot, even though it may have aired at one point. And I think it was released, released as a videotape, if I remember correctly. It definitely did. Y- I think, yes, I think that has a copy. Okay, we did. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it was it was originally going to be the first X Men the animated series, and then it just never went past the pilot stage. And how is it? I, just what what do you think of it? Because I haven't seen it. It's it's it's, it's GI Joe era animation. Like that's basically what it is. Like uh, in fact, a lot of the voice actors from GI Joe show up on it. Uh, like I heard so, some of them in these in these Spider Man episodes I watched last night. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, it it's decent, but it, it's it's certainly not X Men the animated series. That's the way I'll put it. Uh, it has a very different style and personality. But Magneto is in that as well, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Um. So we dive in, brothers. By all means. Sure. Because mm-hmm. I, I can't get anything working, so I might as well listen. To, <laughs> I was trying to bring up stuff so I could play along. It's not working. <laughs> okay. So let's start with some some basic statistics. So. Magneto first appeared, as we see on the screen, X-Men number one, uh, cover date September 1963. I believe it's actual publishing month was July of mm-hmm. 1963. July 2nd, to be precise. Right from the get-go, Magneto's secret identity is confusing because for a long period of time, we thought he was of the Roma people. We thought that his name was Eric Lencher. Yeah. And we know today through retro continuity, especially that these, the story Magneto, I think it's called Magneto Testament. From 2009. X-Men colon Magneto M-Dash Testament. Well done. By mm. Greg Ock and Carmine D. Gian Domenico. Excellent hyperbole, sir. That, you know, he is definitely Jewish. His name is Max Eisenhart. So we were just establishing that. And, of course, the creators yeah. of Magneto, as certainly his visual more than anything else, are Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. So, mm. I mean, for me, one of the most striking components of Magneto's visual is the helmet. I mean, I think the helmet yeah. is one of the most dynamic designs yeah. in, in all of supervillandom, so to speak. And easily recognizable easily easily and obviously they've introduced we'll talk about this different features to the helmet that it's more than just a sh- like a headpiece um but what do we think of the helmet as just a striking visual for this character it's, ex- it's excellent I, th- I think that nothing nothing makes him stand out more than the helmet honestly 
Yeah. Murd? Mm -hmm. Oh, look at this. Yep. I have here a, a study oh, that, of the helmet. A, that's a great reprint. Yes, an extreme close-up or like quarter profile here by uh, none other than Bill Sienkiewicz from the cover of Magneto Number no. Zero. The yeah. Send away comic of uh, the early 90s. Um, you, you can see kind of the the feathered border around the eye holes, you know, the, the the large sort of ornamental lobster claw crest on yep, the top. I love the crest. Subject, suggestive not only of you know, like a, an animal's or a claw or pincer, but also of uh, a magnet. Yep, it's it's as good a you know, crypto fascist symbol as any. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it, it's certainly very distinctive and striking. And the red and purple color scheme too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a great it's a great Kirby design. Um, so that's that's where we're going to start. Now, I wanted to start actually for tradition whenever I can find some are some primary source documents from some of the creators of the character we're discussing. So I found a great contrast. So I found a Rolling Stone 2014 interview with Stan Lee, where he's talking specifically about the X-Men and mutants in Magneto. And then there's a 2019 Vulture interview with Chris Claremont, where he's talking about Magneto. And I think it's a very interesting contrast. Now, Stan Lee, um, I mean, he's near the end of his life. He's early 90s at this point when he's being interviewed. He's still obviously very withered and sharp. But, you know, sometimes when I read these interviews, he gave so many of them. You start to feel like he kind of has like like his and I don't, I don't blame him, but like these automatic like stock answers to what he's yeah. being asked, depending. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. depending on what what he's being questioned about. Yeah. Um, so. The interviewer is going to ask him questions about one one of the th big themes of Magneto is that is he supposed to be like Malcolm X and is is like Charles Xavier Martin Luther King Jr. That's that's kind of like a you often hear that that analogy being made when people discuss these characters, um, which we'll talk about. And so the interviewer is going to ask about that. So I'll read. So here's here's Lee talking. My favorite villain was Magneto, and I love the idea of the X Men being good mutants. And then we get a bunch of bad mutants. We make it seem as if the bad mutants had a point there. The human race hated them and feared them and shunned them and was trying to get rid of them. So why should they take it lying down? Why didn't they fight back? The main idea was to show that bigotry is really a terrible thing. And we should all get along with each other no matter how different we are. That's that's classic Stanley optimism right there. Mm -hmm. then, then the interviewer asked him a question. Were you aware that Professor X is more like MLK and then Magneto is more like Malcolm X? Was that a conscious projection there? I th think it was certainly an unconscious feeling. Yeah, and I never felt Magneto was 100% bad. I mean, there were reasons why he felt that way, but it was just up to Professor X to find some way to make him understand that he was on the wrong track. Now, all respect and affection for Stan Lee, that's that's who he um, <laughs> so if, you, if you look at the Magneto of the Silver Age, he is dynamic, distinct visual side. Boilerplate, tin pot, mm -hmm. demagogue, want to take over the earth. He does have the spin of I want to you know, rule the humans. Um, Ian, would you go to the Homo Superior image, please? Uh, yes, I th I'm hoping that I got the right one here. Is is that is that his his head and then a whole bunch of uh, of others? What, what's what's the no, no, name? It's just says, it just says Homo Superior under the. Just says Homo Superior. Okay, all right. Maybe you know what a console. Yeah. Kind of in, in oh yes. Bio. Okay, I, I think this might be it. So. I'm going to read, in case you're not, you're only listening along, I'm going to read the dialogue. So it's just Magneto, beautiful Kirby art at one of his consoles. The human race no longer deserves dominion over the planet Earth. The day of the mutants is upon us. And he, by the way, he's shouting this every, every sentence is an exclamation point. Mm -hmm. The first phase of my plan shall be to show my power to make Homo sapiens bow to Homo superior. So that's the early Magneto. And I think it's fair to say he doesn't deviate much from that sort of line do you agree murd not for uh, a while yeah no. throughout the 1960s and this um, is still x-men number one right this is his very first appearance yeah so this this will continue um again as everything lee and kirby or lee and ditko or lee and heck did the kernel is always there the initial idea at least from my perspective is so well done that mm. future creators come in and they, they, they you know what hey let's try this with them and they, and they, they because that initial idea is so good then it flourishes in the hands of someone else. And I think for, I think that's really what happens with this character. What do you guys think when it comes to like pre Claremont Magneto and like, po and like Claremont Magneto, what do you think? Well, what, what's the question? So I just tongue tied myself now. So <laughs> my, 
my question is, do you think this is kind of the way Magneto was until we get to that sort of late Bronze Age period? I think there was probably a little bit of growth in between, but uh, yeah. certainly he, he takes a quantum leap once Claremont yeah. gets in there and decides yeah. to actually humanize this guy. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that that Stan Lee, when it comes to villains in particular, I, I, we at least you know not all the time, but a lot of the time. Stan Lee is very boilerplate with his with his villains. Um, they are villains because they are bad and they want to do bad. Um, and uh, it, it, it lessened over time. Obviously, when you got to like the Norman Osborns of the world, where you know there were there were a, a little bit uh, a little bit more nuanced. But I'm, I don't think Magneto quite got there until Claremont. To be entirely honest with you, I think that he was kind of the boilerplate baddie for a decent amount of time. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree. I think it's um I think it's Claremont's quantum leap that makes him so relatable. And from that point forward, he is ambiguous at best through most of my reading tenure with him. Um, there's plenty of times when you're reading what he's saying and what he's taking his mutants, uh, especially things like Geonosha and whatnot, where his stance really isn't all that wrong. Maybe well, he's the head of state at that point. He's running right, country. right. Yeah. And how yeah. he's approaching things might not be great, but it's not entirely wrong either. Very gray area with him uh, from a certain point on. And, and Claremont really starts that. Honey, well said. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Let me read from Claremont's uh, Vulture interview, uh, 2000, June of 2019. He, here he's talking about Magneto as a Silver Age villain. He was your typical melodramatic, I guess, mega villain, for want of a better term. He believed in mutant supremacy. There were no, there was no reason given for it. Without Magneto, the X-Men had nobody. And then he's, now he's talking about how he approached the character. We wanted to re-energize Magneto and redefine in a way that made him a more credible adversary, but also a more credible person. In the same way that we embarked on doing that with the new team. If we're going to define a more rounded Wolverine and Nightcrawler and Aurora and Colossus, then we cannot leave their adversary in his original vacuum. So I think it's an interesting contrast between when the character was first conceived and then like with so many so many Marvel concepts, when, when, when a new writer came in a little bit younger, different time period, different sort of generational mindset, and they run with it. And I, I think when it comes to Magneto, as readers, we're really getting a real treat. I mean, I think what Shane just described really hits the nail on the head with why Magneto is such a compelling figure to read, to read about. So, all right. Um, Ian, any other comments on uh, any of these primary sources before I move on? Uh, just, just that uh, I, I, I think that Another another prime example also is that the X Men to me kind of didn't even really become the X Men until Giant Size X Men in a lot of ways. Uh, that that once we got you know like the fact that there was uh, about like what was it a two year gap where they were just doing re reprints of previous X Men work. Yep. Um, it said to me that that they hadn't quite found their voice and they haven't quite found yeah, that was that was longer than two years actually. Yeah. yeah. Um. And and that. You know, once they did find their center, then we got the X Men, and that's how the X Men became the premier title of Marvel in general for you know years to come afterwards. So those beginning stages were beginning stages for a reason. We had to get we had to get somewhere. And I should also emphasize because Ian made a good point, tip to the history there. If someone's interested in sort of reading that sort of lost period, because the, the X Men did appear in other titles mm -hmm. um, in that sort of early Bronze Age period. Like they appear, appear in a classic Marvel team up with Spider-Man and Morbius. I want to say issue five, I think three or five. Um, they appear in a Captain America story. Um, they pop up. Uh, sometimes they're not even wearing costumes um, in some of these stories. But like Ian said, and I agree, once they brought in the new team and they, and they made a connection between the old team and the new team, they didn't just forget about the old team. Um, and then they really started to world build. And, and I, I agree when you think about what makes the X-Men so special, um, it, it's it's rooted in that, you know, that that mid 1970s period. I mean, as I said before, as I was reading different stories and research, I, I, I realized how much I, I really love the Claremont era, especially like from the beginning to like into the mid 80s or so. I, I think it's some of the most exciting comics being produced of, of that time. I really should start and read that from start to finish, which I've never done. I've read sporadic issues here and there, storylines and whatnot, but I've never read the entirety of it all. Oh, I highly recommend it because it's it's if you like the writer not, and Claremont's not for everybody, mm -hmm. but if you like the writer, it's his vision working with these great artists. 
all the way through. I mean, there are times where you can tell Claremont forgot about a plot line. There's the classic dangling plot, plot threads in X-Men, which are you know notorious mm. uh, in some cases, but you can tell how much he loves these characters and, and Magneto too, and how he's, he's developing them as people. Um, it, it's, it's really exciting stuff. I always, I always felt like Claremont's X-Men was very much um, Marv Wolfman's Titans, Teen Titans. I think more than one person has made that comparison. Just, mm-hmm. just yeah. the way that they approached each subject matter was their high point, especially at that time. Yeah. Yep. Ian, would you put up the classic Jim Lee issue one cover, please? Of course. From uh, X-Men Volume 2, which I think was one of the highest selling comics of all time. No, the correctly. highest. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the highest. highest. Yeah. Well, with what, 17 copies? copies uh... I wanted to go into, into discussing Magneto's power set, and I wanted you to put up this particular image. I think this is, I think a lot of people think of Magneto visually. They think of Jim Lee's rendering of the character. I'm, Ian, I'm sure you do, for example. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I don't think anyone drew a more majestic powerful and intimidating magneto than than jim lee um Mm -hmm. just the the sheer grandeur of the character um and i think the art really emphasizes how powerful this character is so magneto is an omega level mutant that's the designation that he's given um so he's one of the most powerful beings in the entire Marvel universe i mean magneto is the kind of character who can take on virtually any other character and has a chance of winning and, and or surviving is so, that what um, Xavier's considered an Omega level? Yes. Is they're higher? Okay. Yes. Um, so obviously the source of Magneto's power is that he has complete control over every facet of magnetism. So like, for example, he can take a planetary's electromagnetic field and he can manipulate it to his, to his advantage, basically. Um, he can generate you know, planetary electromagnetic pulses and wipe out all power systems. You saw that in, in X-Men 25, Volume 2, which we'll talk about. Um, he can conjure up magnetic shield so that's why he can fight you know Thor or the hulk or submariner and not die basically um and these shields can protect him from the blast of a nuclear warhead so go ahead now, go ahead, does he get have we seen and i just can't remember does he get exhausted when like if he's battling hulk does he tire out from creating those kind of shields there is a limit and the other thing i want to mention i'm glad you reminded me of it is that the real burden of Magneto's powers that they've revisited multiple times throughout his character's history, especially since the 91 story, is that because he's, his body is, is sort of housing these awesome energies, it has an impact on him psychologically. Okay. So mm-hmm. they've kind of like how they came up with the whole like Namor when he's in and out of water, like mm-hmm. that, that affects exactly. him. So Magneto's... Um, his his mental faculties mm-hmm. are, it disrupts the neuroelectric yeah, field yeah, of his exactly. brain well, and uh, right. causes him to act irrationally sometimes. Right. So okay. they've Megal- used megalomaniacally right. sometimes. Megal- so, so they've used that as, as an explanation for some of the times where he's been especially, you know, off the rails. Hmm. Silver agey. It's, exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but that, that's a theme they return to um, again and again. Now, I have examples where, for example, in in, in, in and when I say Uncanny X Men, I mean Volume One, of course. So in Uncanny right. X Men. 112, he's able to break free from lava in an underground volcano because he uses shields. In Champion 16, ah, the Bronze Age murd, mm-hmm. um, he can ward off Ghost Rider's Hellfire, so his shields are incredibly powerful. Um, and also his body armor, and I didn't know this just from reading about it, so he reinforces it by tapping into magnetic fields. So that's what makes his body armor also very powerful and it's very hard to actually hurt him. Now, as we've seen, Wolverine's adamantium claws can penetrate the armor, because they've done that in more than once dramatic fashion. Um, but in general, that's, that's a very, a very effective defensive weapon. Um, he can shoot, you know, magnetic rays and EMP pulses from his hands. We all see Magneto fly. So, Murd, how does he fly? Do you know? Uh, I he just... his hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and believes really hard. And no, he uh, <laughs> follows along the, uh, I guess you could call them Lee lines or like oh, the, the, the meridians of electromagnetic yep. force. Basically, the magnetic field lines, he interfaces with them and he manipulates them so he can fly, essentially. Mm-hmm. We, we've seen him fly in space because he puts one of those shields around him so he can breathe, basically. Um, he also can uh, he also can control electrokinesis, so he can shoot bolts of electricity. Um, I always love this, that he can, he can ma- manipulate metal matter at the subatomic level. He can even manipulate the iron in your bloodstream. I was just going to say, is uh, that because he did that a couple of times yes. in the movies? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he can control people that way. Um, basically, it was brilliant of Kirby and Lee to 
come up with a man- magnetically powered villain because there's so much you can do with a character like that when you really get into the science of, of Magnus, which I know very little about. But um, just by reading about it, it, great idea. So Magneto is also, of course, a brilliant scientist. We saw the image of um, Ian have of him by the computers. Um, he's, he's involved in genetic engineering. He's created different mut- mut- mutates, for example, mm-hmm. robots. We'll talk about the nanny robot as an example of that. Computers, like he built Asteroid M. He built an underground volcano base. So this guy, you know, is he's not like a, an intellectual piker in the Marvel Universe. He's a very brilliant figure. I mean, he's, probably, he's not on a Victor Von Doom or, or Reed Richards level, but he's up there, essentially. Can, can, can I also say that Please. he has... He has incredibly convenient powers, uh, as as is as is the case with many many a character in Marvel and DC uh, and anywhere else in between. Is that magnetism, as we human beings know it, is not necessarily Magneto's powers. Magneto's powers are whatever you want magnetism to be at that particular moment. <laughs> It makes me think of the insane clown posse. Effing magnets, how do they work? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so like... Magnet and magic begin with the same three letters. (laughs) There you go, there you go, yeah. I've seen him do some crazy shit over the years in in comics, and it it all depends on on just how powerful they want to make him that day. You know, it's just like how uh, Wolverine can regenerate himself from a drop of blood, depending on the writer. You know, he can do anything with his with his magnetic abilities if he puts his, his mind to it. That's the way it works. And that cold bath of reality was from Ian Levenstein. Thank you, sir. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, any comments before we go into the origin of the character? Well, well just to piggyback on what Ian Please. was saying. There, there were some moments in the Silver Age particularly mm-hmm. when things get extra, you know, Stan Lee-ish. And, yeah. uh, and uh, he tends to develop uh, kind of low-level quasi-telepathic abilities when it's you know, convenient for I the person doing that. the writing. Yeah. Yeah, like sometimes yeah. uh, the, in an early confrontation with Xavier, he just randomly astral projects himself onto the astral plane <laughs> to confront <laughs> Xavier there. He sometimes has like telepathic sensitivity to the presence of mutants, making himself like a living cerebro. And then, of course, there's his magnetic hypnotism. Which I guess yes. you can, I think like Roy Thomas and other writers who feel like explaining that kind of thing, explain it as his ability to control the flow of blood into people's brains, thus making them docile and uh, uh, suggestible. But, yeah, but other writers are just like, yeah, magnetic hypnosis. Yeah, there, And, there and more than once I've heard, you know, you just read about how it's his will that allows <laughs> to withstand Xavier's, you know, omega level telepathy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it's magnets, baby. <laughs> All right, so the boy known as Max, as I mentioned, was born and raised in Nuremberg, Germany, uh, obviously born uh, prior to the uh, Second World War. Now, interestingly, they, they don't establish Magneto as Jewish definitively in the Marvel Universe because they already done it in the movies. But uh, yeah. until 2009's Magneto, as Murd mentioned, a testament story. Um. That's where they go. They show his family, you know, it, 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 as victims of the Holocaust, all of that. So that's where that. But before that, there's really just uh, moments where, especially as well, I mean, it's really it's with Claremont. This, this none of this comes out with Lee and Kirby or, or Roy Thomas or these other or, or uh, Neil Adams or whatever. But um, Claremont starts to establish. It really begins in X Men One Fifty, which is a story I'm going to talk about at length because that, that's a crucial issue in the character's history, where Magneto reveals that he was at Auschwitz. That his entire family was wiped out, and then he, you know, he, he he's a, he's a victim of, of that monstrous persecution, and from there there are moments both in the X Men comic and the New Mutants comic because he becomes the headmaster of the New Mutants for a period of time as well, where, oh wow, look, just pure Levenstein. That's from Testament, right? Indeed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's so that's, that's the that's that has up on the screen is when Magneto's family is killed. So they, the story goes that they, they were so. They flee Germany as, as after Kristallnacht. So anybody who knows anything about the history of the Third Reich is familiar with Kristallnacht, which means the night of broken glass. When uh, the Nazi government, this is in November of 1938, 1938 uh, essentially sanctioned um, their thugs, the stormtroopers, to go out and, and basically just loot and, 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 and smash up uh, Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues. Uh, they were encouraged to arrest uh, you know, younger Jewish men. Um, it, it's seen as one of one of the real sort of steps towards 
the, the full horror of the Holocaust, when you start to see the Nazi government openly supporting the persecution of its Jewish citizens um, in Germany. So in, in, the, in the fictitious version of this, Max's family flees Germany after Kristallnacht and they go to Poland and Poland had the largest pre-war Jewish population in Europe. Of course, we'll not have that same number after after the war. Now, the, of course, as we as we all know, the Germans invade Poland on September 1st, 1939, the opening gambit of Hitler's uh, military campaigns, and Poland is conquered. And then Poland is basically ceases to exist as a country. The Nazis divide it up. Parts of it goes to the Soviet Union. Uh, they divide up other parts. And he ends up with his family in the Warsaw Ghetto, where in the history, the Nazis began to round up the uh Polish Jews and, and deposit them and, and, and Jews from other areas as well into this sort of confined part of Warsaw. People should understand that when we think about the Holocaust, they didn't just start killing people right away. And Hitler didn't write an order saying, okay, now you're going to do this. He never actually gave a written order. It was all sort of understood from the speeches he gave and, and things he said. And then people kind of acted out on that. But this develops over time. So the ghetto is where they were con congregating a lot of these people. And then eventually they would then be shipped off to where they'd be worked to death or, or murdered in these, these various camps. So in the story, his family escapes from the ghetto prior to being sent off to a, a labor camp or a death camp. And as Ian showed in the image, they're caught by uh, German troops and his family's lined up to be shot. And the last moment, um, Max's father sort of pushes him away and everybody's shot. The, the German soldiers assume the boy has been killed too. They're all, he's, he's basically buried alive in a mass grave. With his dead family so right there you know this is obviously a, a character who's going to be haunted that's always gonna have a massive impact on everything he does going forward and again in the claremont period they do start to make allusions to that history which then testament expands upon dramatically ian thanks for showing that image yeah no worries question where did he get the name magnus because that, that that that's the name I, that i feel that i feel like i re relate the most to him even though that's not his, so his name. We're going to talk about that. Basically, that's that based on the, the retro continuity and, and, and the stories, the stories. Got it. That's a name he created for himself, okay. which he used sometimes as like a middle name or a last name. It, it's just an alias. Basically. Okay. Sure. Maybe he created that out of, out of tribute to his, his, his late wife, Magda, um, mm. this, uh, you know, creative license guess on my part, mm. but awesome. so Eventually, Max is captured by the Germans, recaptured, and he's sent to Auschwitz. Now, remember, Auschwitz, of course, one of the, one of the uh, preeminent death camps in, in much, much of the Holocaust occurred in Poland. Many of the, the infamous camps were in Poland. So Auschwitz was there as part of a larger industrial complex. And when you were sent there, if you were seen as well enough to work, you worked. Otherwise, you were murdered. So in the stories, and they, they interweave history, um, he... He meets up with Magda. Magda. Magda was of the Roma peoples. And then remember, the Nazis persecuted the Roma as well as racial undesirables. So she was there because he, he met her as a child when he lived in Germany. He, he always had like, like a, a, a great affection for her. And they, they reconnect. They, they help each other survive. Now, he becomes a, a Sonder Commando, which means the Nazis would create euphem euphemisms for the, the, the Holocaust. So these are called the special command units, which were uh, camp inmates who were then used to basically cart off the dead and clean out the crematoria, horrific jobs. And he did this, and this has also helped him survive. And in the storyline, they're going to bring it to Marvel continuity. He sees Mr. Sinister at the camp working with this historical person, uh, Joseph Mengele, the infamous SS doctor, was the angel of death, who did all kinds of genetic experimentation and, and just horrific uh, unethical experiments on inmates. So in this version, Sinister, as with his obsession with genetics, is there working with Mengele on inmates. There's an event in the actual history of Auschwitz. I forgot the year where there's actually a brief revolt in the camp, um, which I mean, which the SS crushed. But ultimately, in the confines of that history, Magda and 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 Max escape, and they move to the Carpathian Mountains. Now, some stories I highly recommend are when the classic X Men series. They did a host of backups, mm -hmm. which Claremont wrote. This is in the 80s with art by the magnificent, uh, I think, English artist John Bolton. Mm -hmm. And basically, well done, Murd, well done. Mm -hmm. Basically, in these stories, Claremont had the opportunity, really, when you think about it, it's a wonderful opportunity for him to go back 
and sort of fill in gaps between the stories he had already written but from the like you know from the late 1970s and the early 1980s so in the back of, and actually marvel collected these there's a trade called vignettes some years ago i don't think it's still in print where they collected all these a lot of these stories and if you're an x-men fan and you're fast about the history seek out these issues because they really flesh out a lot of events beautifully. For example, there's one where remember when, when Proteus, they're fighting Proteus and he, he's going after Wolverine and Nightcrawler. They really explore how Wolverine and Nightcrawler are affected by being cast into, into, into the uh, maddening you know, hallucinations of Proteus's world, for example. So they're great stuff. So he does a whole series on Magneto in these classic X-Men stories. So Ian, if you can, bring up the Magda and Max image, please. Uh, yep, let me find that. So... Basically, in classic X-Men number 12, in the backup story, they go into where Max was post-Auschwitz. So he, he and Magda go to the Carpathian Mountains, so they're in the Balkan region, and they marry, and they have a daughter named Anya. And and they, they show this, I think, in one of the X-Men movies. Yeah, was, so I was just going to say, I, I wondered where that came yeah. from, but it's not – I don't know if they named them ever – yeah, I'm it's, pretty sure the daughter had a name. It's, and, it's uh, in one. Of, it's in one of the later films. One of the ones that I think. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not the third one, which I can't even remember. Apocalypse, Apocalypse. X Men Apocalypse, yep. which yeah. was bad for yeah. a number of reasons. So, basically, they explore in this this short story, beautifully drawn, um, that they have kind of an idyllic life considering what they just survived, and they decide they're going to move to. Uh, Mer, would you pronounce it? I, I'm going to butcher it. This the, the it's Soviet a, city, a city in the in Ukraine. Ukraine now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vinnytsia. Uh, as soon as I find it here, yeah. I'm writing it. I'm sure that what you just said is is pretty close to it. Right here, Mer. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Vinnytsia. Yeah. That's how oh, I'd say. There it. you go. So that's in Ukraine. Then it was part of the Soviet Union. So they go to live there because he wants he wants more opportunities to, to advance himself for the sake of his family, in terms of earning an income, and basically. He knows he has his powers by this point because, you know, they usually manifest themselves when you're adolescent sure. in the Marvel Universe. And uh, they're, he just put up on the screen um, magnificent Ooh. artwork. Um, that's uh, that's burn artwork. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like burn. So that's Max and Magda in the camps. And then notice how much he's burn is drawn Magneto to resemble Quicksilver. Um, and then when they, they, they've escaped, they, they're starting their, their life. So basically – his boss is cheating him out of his pay, and he responds by uh, – he flings with his powers, I think like a wrench or something or a hammer. Um, crowbar. A crowbar, thank you, at the guy. So now the secret is out, and a fire breaks out in the inn that they're staying in in Venezia, and Anya, the daughter, is trapped, and the, the crowd gathers. They, 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 they stop – Max from going in to rescue his child. And the child, it's pretty graphic in the comic. You see the kid like pour out, fall to the building and burn to death in front of her father. Oh, for heaven's sake. Now, you can imagine how the character then reacted. <laughs> so mm. basically, his magnetic powers really then manifest themselves on sort of their omega level for the first time. He kills everyone around him and he destroys much of the city in his rage and his grief. Now, Magda is there. She's horrified. And she flees. She, 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 she's afraid of him. And I think they never see each other again, um, if I remember correctly. I think you're right. Now, she goes off to one Degore Mountain. Now, actually, I have to ask this, Murph, because in doing my research, it was confusing. Some of what I was reading seemed to indicate that Magneto was not the father of Pietro and Wanda. It's a recent he? It's a recent ret retcon. Okay. And uh, it's done out of reasons decide. external to the world of comics. It's all based that, on yeah. movie studio politic nonsense because Marvel, you know, Marvel Studios didn't have the right to the X-Men for a while, so they wanted to dissociate Wanda and Pietro from on, on you know the Marvel Studios side right. of the fence from Magneto on the you know X-Men Fox side of the Okay, side. so as far as we're concerned, he's their father then. <laughs> yeah, yes. It was too I mean, granted that was a retcon establishing yeah. his parentage over them, but it was so perfect and yeah. so many good stories came of it. I kind of hate to see it thrown in the garbage yeah. for yeah. such petty reasons. So yeah, okay. in my head canon, there's yeah. that word that yeah, that the his his paternal is still legitimate. Ian, go ahead. And, and, and I and I'm pretty sure that they have essentially put the middle finger up to that retcon anyway, just because you know that was done out of uh, as Murd was saying back when they didn't have the right city X Men. They have the right city X Men again. There's no reason for the comics to suffer because of a past mistake 
uh, from the high above Perlmutters of the world. So I, I think I think that uh, and I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Pietro has been around uh, uh, the past couple of, uh, of 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 years, even with the whole thing going on with uh, Kokoa and what have you. And I don't think they're saying he's an inhuman anymore. So, yeah, let's just go with that. <laughs> wow. They Sounds said he was good. My, my, our master's producer yeah. has spoken oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. all as well. Yeah. So she goes to Wonder Girl Mountain, and this is a whole, really, a whole other story, essentially. We've talked about this a little bit in some of our Avengers spotlights. Mm-hmm. But basically, she's pregnant. She gives birth to the twins. Um, th- she then wanders off and, and according to what i read she later died in tunisia i, I believe so, supposedly and the kids were then raised by who murd uh they are raised by the high evolutionary oh no wait i'm sorry no no there's yeah yeah it's the high evolutionary's uh cow woman bova is the yes. midwife in their birth yes. but she gives them to Django and uh I, I think his wife's name is either magda or mari something that sounds a lot like magda mm. maximoff yep and that's how they end up with the names wanda okay. and pietro maximoff yep i don't know so, if I that they're really a whole nother episode, but they're going to come up, obviously, periodically in what we're talking about here. Now, yep. they establish in X-Men Volume 2, number 72, that Magneto then created the – he created the identity of Eric Lenscher, which is what most of us know him as. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, that's the name they've used, of course, in the films as yep. well, um, as a, a Romani Holocaust survivor. So, again, just – it's pejorative, but most people are familiar with it. It's a gypsy, hmm. okay, and which is what Mag, Magda actually was, and – so they, he took on that persona when he's with her. Then she, then they, they, they're, they're separated. Um, he never finds. He also creates the middle name of Magnus, which we, 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 as we've noticed, he's also used sometimes just as like a last name. Mm-hmm. So again, Magneto's actual name is confusing depending on what period you're reading and what, you know, as Ian mentioned, what politics were in play behind the scenes and so forth. Now, what I also find very interesting is that Claremont clearly – was establishing that Magneto was a Jewish Holocaust survivor, but they they never again never come out and flat out state that until the Testament story that Ian had on the mm. screen earlier. So I'm going to read a very interesting um, from that same Vulture interview where, where they talk about this. This is the narrator speaking first. You may notice something absent from that revelation: the word Jew. Throughout Marvel's history, religion had been a major taboo, so one might assume that the vagueness of Magneto's background was an editorial directive. Not so, says Claremont. This is Claremont speaking. The reason we decided to err on the side of tact, discretion, use whatever word you like in that regard, was that we weren't playing with our character, per se. He was a pre-established character, a Stan character, a Stan Jack character. So he didn't want to mess around with the core of his origin to that great an extent, certainly without getting a green light from Stan. He then goes on to say this to Claremont. I wasn't sure how it would play, but how I wanted to make it play. I wanted to keep everybody wondering exactly where we were going to land with this, partly because on one level, the Holocaust is a uniquely Jewish experience, but on the other level, it's also in European terms, a more universal experience as well. The Holocaust is specific to Judaism, but also embraces a significant number of other minorities, which is very true. Oftentimes, people forget that, obviously, the, the Nazis' relentless fanaticism about their cockeyed notions of race and science and genes and mm-hmm. you know tying Jews to the spread of communism or they would have said Bolshevism and all of that was set for central. But a lot of other groups were also swept up on the Holocaust, such as Magda's Romani people, for example. So that that's Claremont's uh, very interesting discussion about that. So he creates this new identity. Now, a key issue I recommend is X-Men, Uncanny X-Men issue 161. Anybody read this? Anybody read that story here? Uncanny X-Men I, 161. Probably. I don't I I I, I may have. I okay. May have. So basically what happens in that it's a flashback. So in that storyline, it's it's after I think it's after the ex Xavier's been in the Korean War. And he goes to Haifa in Israel. Oh, is this the one with uh, Gabriel Haller? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he, he's working at a a psychiatric hospital dedicated to treating Holocaust survivors. And oh, he's not calling himself Magneto yet, but Magneto is there as a character called Eric Magnus. And he's also he's working there as an orderly at the, at the, at the clinic. And who's Gabriel Howler? Mer, go ahead. Uh, well, at the time, uh, she was uh, well done, Ian, a, a, a comatose patient. Yeah. Um, whom uh, Xavier, I guess, was helping to treat or something. And uh, uh, so, so he and uh, Magnus kind of came together in their mutual desire to protect 
this woman. And they, they develop, a, this is where their, their friendship really begins. And there are scenes of them, you know, having friendly debates about the future of mutant kind and their different, you can see their different ideologies forming. And they, did they, they know they were mutants? Not well, not to the end of the story. So they, a good question, Shane. So they were hiding their abilities from. Yeah. So the, each of them each knew other. that he yeah. was a mutant, but they didn't know each other were mutants. Correct. Mm-hmm. It. And it turns out that Gabriella was a Holocaust survivor. And for whatever reason, the Nazis had put in her head. She had the location of, 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 of a, a, a huge uh, trove of Nazi gold. Enter Baron Strucker. War criminal, now the head of Hydra. And he wants to get his hands on her because then he needs this gold to help fund the, the beginnings of this, this you know, fascist organization that he's now helming. And basically, Eric and Charles reveal each other's powers as they come to defend her against Hydra. And there's a great scene where, at the end of the story, Magneto is now fully showing his power, and and he's just wiping the floor with the Hydra minions. And he defeats Strucker, and he did basically tells Strucker, you know, who he what he is, and he, then he buries Strucker and his men alive. And he flies away with all the gold to fund his future campaign. Mm-hmm. So he and Charles, are even at this early stage, there's clearly this affinity, but they're all clearly going in different directions. So it's a, it's a great origin story. Again, Claremont and Bits and Pieces kind of fleshing out Magneto as a character. This is a key issue in that in that project, essentially. So I highly recommend issue 161 of X-Men um, yeah, Volume I, 1. I'm sure I never read that. That's uh, that's interesting with the Strucker. Oh, yeah. And of course, Gabby is the mother of who? Murd. Of uh, David Charles Holler, yes. alias Legion. Yes. Oh. Uh-huh. So. All right. Didn't he have a television show? Yes, yes. he did on, on did. the FX network. Was it, is, it, is it good? I What I watched of it, it was. It's yeah. strange and surrealist. Yeah. And uh, I, I think the first season is better than the second, personally. Just... Yeah, I, I've only ever watched the first season. I need to eventually catch myself up and watch what, it, what, else, what came afterwards. Does it acknowledge the X-Men or no? Very no. briefly. There's like one tantalizing little scene of a, a wheelchair wheel with an X in the spokes turning in front of the camera. We never actually okay. see Xavier. Okay. Already. The Professor X stuff, is that him in his mind's eye seeing it you mean legion's character yeah i don't know i don't know i didn't see it is that his mind's eye seeing that Uh, a premonition uh, well yeah yeah he's he's seen sees all kinds of things in his mind's eye in the course of this series it's yeah it's okay strange strange stuff so what i'm talking about now are I'm piecing together different stories, different periods that they kind of form when you put them all together a chronology of magneto's origin essentially so Classic X Men nineteen, which I think is the issue that is featured in that that Magneto special that Merge showed before. Actually, this, which by the by was a uh, mail in uh, premium, you, it was not available in the specialty uh, the stores. Was that a Wizard or um, comic scene? Um, I think it might have just been through Marvel. I don't oh. see any Wizard or comic scenes logos okay. on it, but yeah, uh, you sent in like uh, coupons or something, and you could get this uh, Magneto number zero, which has both of the classic X Men. That we're talking for, about for number oh, twelve and number nineteen, and also a couple of pages from X Men Unlimited number two, where we first get the uh, uh, Eric Magnus Lenshair uh, alias. Yes, well done, Murd. So in classic mm-hmm. X Men nineteen, this this is a key issue, uh, I think, because this this is a story where Claremont really establishes. Actually, I think it takes place before X Men one sixty one, but where he establishes Mac Eric Magnus, we're to call him as Magneto. So in the story. So it's 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 let's assume it's the late 1940s, early mm-hmm. 50s, and he's working as a well done Ian, mm-hmm. classic of 19 on the screen right now. He's working as a covert agent. He's like a covert Nazi hunter. Now, what we have to understand in the actual history is that as the war in Europe was coming to an end, both the United States and the Soviet Union realized, okay, the Nazis of all these scientists have developed rocketry, jet engines, all kinds of other weaponry. We want to get our hands on these people. Sure. And the Nazis had – they, they also want to get their hands on Nazi intelligence officers, SS officers, people who had knowledge they could use in the already clearly coming Cold War. So both sides were – you know, had like their Nazis in quotes who did technological or intelligence work for one side or the other in the Cold War. So in the story, Eric is capturing uh, Nazi war criminals, and he's working both for – we assume it's the United States. They don't say, but it's a Western intelligence agency and the Mossad, which is the which is the Israeli uh, intelligence unit that works outside of Israel's borders. And basically, he, he's turning over these war criminals to the Mossad. Now, 
we find out that his Western handlers, his control, as he's called, is allowing this because he's been capturing Soviet Nazis, so to speak. Then in the story, he goes after one of the United States' Nazi assets. He's, he's discouraged from doing that. He persists in it. And then the his, his Western intelligence handlers murder Isabel, who's this woman. I think it's kind of like a counselor to him. Right. You know, like um, a therapist of some yeah. kind who's been working with and him and she, is also seeing him romantically. Yeah, they're involved romantically. And this is one of the first times where she talks about it. Claremont's putting the words in her mouth that she's concerned that the, the use of his powers may be affecting his mind and his mental stability. Yep, this is instance before she dies. I'm quoting here. You manipulate the primal energies of the Earth, the planetary magnetic field through your body. That must have some effect. Yeah. Your seizures involve the central nervous system. If there's disruption to that bioelectrical network, goodness knows what effects it's having in turn on the structure of your brain. Gasp! And then her throat is cut. Is cut. And then Eric, of course, wipes out the uh, intelligence agents from the West. We assume they're American who have come in to do this. And then, of course, he, see, then, then he says, basically, I am Magneto. And he then goes off and now we're all in trouble. So, <laughs> Mert, that's clutch. Thank you. The, those sto- Go ahead, Shane. So if he never used his powers, would yes. he ever be injured? Or is it just the use of the powers that causes his body harm? So the way they've established it over the years is that and this is all Claremont, that the more he uses this awesome power and the fact that his body has to, his nervous system, mm-hmm. as we mentioned, mm-hmm. has to actually harness all this, yeah, the, the the more damage it might take on his mm-hmm. his central nervous system, his brain and everything just, else. Just on his being, body, his muscle systems, but yeah. also his brain. Just being the mutant tapped into that would always be hurting his, his body, even if he never used it. Just as Ian not nearly out, as much. Yeah, and as Ian pointed out, it depends on the writer. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was going to say, because like I would think that if that then, yeah, if he doesn't release the powers after a certain amount of time, that it would cause some sort of, you know, potential harm to him. Uh, but again, depends on the writer. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other comments there before we move on to our checklist? No. So what I'm going to do, like just kind of like we did Dr. Doom, Magneto has so many appearances, not as many as, as Doom does, but enough that I'm, I'm picking and choosing. I'm sure Murd has some on his fabled uh, yellow legal pad that we can yep. fill in. Yes, assuming I can uh, perceive them with my eyesight. Mert, I'll, put, uh, put that, would you put that up in the camera? Just show just show that. Look at that. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I, I love it. To, to some people, it'll probably look like a blank page, but I assure you there's <laughs> many lines of tiny little ant footprints across this sheet of yellow paper. Um, amazing. But, so I will interject freely as Excellent. seems appropriate to me. So we'll start with um, a, a retcon that I thought was really fun. Remember when Marvel did the minus one issues? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Years 97. Back. Murder of the Year. Perfect. So they did a, a X-Men volume two minus one. And it's Xavier and Magneto. They go to a, a commemorative ceremony at the site of Auschwitz in Poland. So it's, it's after the war. I, I don't remember what year it was supposed to be, but it's before the X-Men and everything. And they meet and, and they're talking and, and they establish that they are essentially our enemies, that their, their ideologies cannot essentially coexist and they kind of remind each other they, they can destroy each other and they, they just kind of part ways. So the friendship have, has of course been really strained by this ideological rift, so to speak. We mentioned X-Men one from 1963, which of course Magneto attacks Cape Citadel His early appearance. He's often trying to get like nuclear weapons, missiles, different technology he can use to advance his, his schemes essentially. And he looks cool, but that's really all we know about in the first issue. Uh, Ian, if you could bring up the Brotherhood pinup, please. Mm-hmm. So issue four is, is a very important issue in the history of the X-Men and the Marvel Universe, wider Marvel Universe, is that Manito gets his gang together. <laughs> great, great retro pinup. Um, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Evil! <laughs> Just in case you weren't sure. So it's Magneto, Toad, Mastermind, and although we don't know yet his children... Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch. And there's a character called Astra who was retconned into the Brotherhood many years later. Yeah, like late 90s. Yeah, who, who, who quit before the Brotherhood became a thing. He, he, she kind of is to the Brotherhood what Kid Vulcan is to the X-Men. Yes, like that. well put, Mer. That, that hidden first generation of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Now we should mention when Mystique starts her first organization, they drop the evil. They just call it the Brotherhood of Mutants, if I remember correctly. <sighs> I, I also regularly forget that Mastermind was a member of this first team because I mean Mastermind, Mastermind is going to have a lot. Oh yeah, and moving forward. Yep. 
Oh yeah. So they uh they try to they take over like Marvel always has these fictitious like mm-hmm. South American country, right. Santa Marco, I think San- it's called. Exactly. They take it over because they want to create this haven for mut- mutant kind. Of course, the X Men come in to stop them. Um, and you, you, you get, I think you, they established from the very beginning, Pietro and especially Wanda are kind of like really not fully on board what they're involved in. And, you know, there's, there's always this hesitancy and, and so forth. Magneto is just like this bloviating megalomaniac in these early stories, right? Basically. He, and he looks cool. Um, yep, he's a bloviating megalomaniac with a bit of a point, but even so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think it's that same issue where uh, he and Xavier have their first ideological debate. That, that, that bit where Magneto astral projects himself yes. up there to, to have it out with Xavier. But we don't know yet. Of course, they had this longstanding relationship that would uh, they explore later. Now, X-Men issue five is the first appearance of Asteroid M. So Magneto's uh, infamous uh, space base is, is orbital... Uh, Asteroid that it figures in many stories. So I thought this was interesting and, and, and wacky and fun. I love the Silver Age. So Journey to Mystery 19. Magneto tries to convince oh, Thor. 109. 109. I'm sorry, sir. My apologies. 109. He tries to uh, encourage Thor to join the Brotherhood. <laughs> He's confusing everybody for yes. music. <laughs> Ian, what do you think about that? I, I, I think I think that if anybody who believes that they can control the machinations of a god just says exactly what Magneto thinks of himself. Well put, sir. <laughs> well put. <laughs> X-Men number six, he tries to convince Namor, who is actually a mutant. Oh, I don't think they established Namor as a mutant then. I don't I don't think so. No. Uh, actually, I have here Go that ahead, uh, he was described that way in uh, Fantastic Four Annual number one. Okay. All right. Okay. So oh, I, okay. Fair enough. Not a long leap from there to have all him right. showing up in X-Men, and he did. And, of course, as we all know, Namor is not one to take orders or to jo- be a joiner. <laughs> not really a group guy. Mm, to say the least. So that does not work out uh, as well. But, again, I love how in the Wakanda Forever film he, he describes himself as a mutant Namor. So there's a lot they can do with him and the X-Men going forward as well. So, oh, there's so many possibilities. It's exciting. Shane, go ahead. The only something. thing I, I didn't like was that he was – that was the first time we heard it in the MCU. It, well, was no, Miss Marvel. Well, that's true. I was corrected last time I made the same that's mistake true. as you last time we discussed it. It's yep. some kind of mutation. I, 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 <laughs> also, that, uh, um, that, that Namor would later on – I mean, way later on – have much further relations with the, the X-Men. Uh, oh, both, yeah. both, both, both as a member of a team, and, and then uh, Avengers versus X Men, that whole story. Avengers versus X Men, Dark X Men. He was a he was a member of that team. Right. So, a lot more mutant kind uh, association to come. With him. By the way, Levy Poo, your beard looks especially striking this evening. <laughs> why, why, why? Why? Thank you. It was professionally done about a week ago. So well done. Right. Well done. <laughs> God, you're a succulent morsel. Okay, now. <laughs> Uncanny X Men issue eleven, Murd the Stranger. Please explain. <laughs> oh, the Stranger. Yes, here's Magneto once again jumping to the wrong conclusion about people <laughs> or not quite people being mutants. Uh, but yeah, so he's gone after Thor. He's gone after Namor. He he goes after the Blob and then kicks him to the curb. He auditions <laughs> Unus the Untouchable Unus to join the, the team. But then he goes after the wrong asset in number eleven because the Stranger just kind of shows up, kind of walking through midair above New York one day, and Magneto thinks. What ho, a new mutant. And uh, and the stranger kind of temporarily uh, agrees to go along with Magneto's little plans. And uh, uh, But then in the end, uh, when, when things go south and the X-Men get involved, uh, the stranger reveals himself to Magneto to be uh, not so much mutant as a uh, cosmically empowered alien being. <laughs> and uh, he decides he's going to take Magneto and the Toad with him into space to be part of his uh, uh, cosmic specimen collection. And we should point out that, oh, well done. Well done. Ooh. Beautiful. Oh, look at that cover. Oh, damn. <laughs> I love the stranger's get up, just the lab coat. And the... Is he, does he, does he become larger than life the way the cover depicts it? Uh, he, uh, he can, yes. right? He can, right? Yeah, he, he certainly can. He, later we learn he's a, well, one of several possible, he's kind of like the, the phantom stranger and that nobody really quite knows what he's about and where he's from. But one okay. possible origin for him is that he's a gestalt being, uh, <laughs> a, a composited from an entire alien race. Containing all their life forces and I guess all their physicality, all their like physical molecules potentially. So yes, he can increase in size. We have an opportunity where Murd used the word gestalt. I get to chill right at my spine. Yep. I'm so happy to be here. That's right another now. place where you should take a drink. <laughs>
Now, um, there was a crossover between the X-Men and the Avengers, um, X-Men 52, Avengers 53. Mm-hmm. What's – say it again. 52. Loud and, loud and proud. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't mentioned Lorna Dane yet. Mm. And, and we certainly should. Polaris, as many listeners will know. Is also another one of Magneto's officer. Magneto really got around, by the way. Like there's, it sure there's, seems. Th- there's good heavens. Th- the man, the man was virile. He was a player. So <laughs> basically, Polaris, as we all know, has magnetic powers. And in the early stories, when she first appears, she's a she's a romantic uh, uh, object of affection for Bobby, the Ice Man, and they're they're together. And Magneto is drawn to her because of obviously she uses magnetic powers, and. She is told that she is his daughter. Now, in these early again, this is where things get confusing again. In these early stories, Bobby goes, No, 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 Lorna, wait, you're not Magneto's daughter. I found evidence. And here's what actually happened. What actually happened was you were in a plane with your parents, like a light plane, and it crashed and they died. You lived. And then your mother's brother, who has the last name of Dane, he took you in, he raised you, and that's who you are. You're not Magneto's child. That was all not true. She is Magneto's child. So <laughs> retrocon later that Magneto went to the crash site because he was because basically what happened was Magneto was having an affair with Lorna's mother, whose name was Susanna. We don't know their last name. And she was the, the, the product of that affair. And the father, her, his name was uh, I think it was Arnold. Yes. He finds out about the affair. So now listen to this. So his wife can't escape the conversation. He takes them up with their kid in this aircraft. And they're arguing about it. And Lauren, as a child, is so upset by her parents arguing, her powers manifest themselves. She destroys the plane. Her parents are killed. Ian shaking his head. And then (laughs) she falls to earth. She lives. Magneto has mastermind change her memories. So she thinks that Magneto was not her. like, Like this is what actually happened to her. That's why Bobby has this story. Now we know from retro continuity later issues that Polaris is the daughter of Magneto. So Ian, you have, you have a comment to make on that. My, my, my comment is, is it's amazing how many uh, X-Men uh, stories begin with plane crashes. <laughs> yeah, it's got the same. Yep. <laughs> and, and, small, plane, and, and, small prop planes flown by the, by the parents. And, and for that matter, how hard is it for Magneto to have children and have them stay his children because <laughs> there there have been so many back and forths with Polaris and Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver that it just just have them be his kids just 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 stop <laughs> <laughs> but for those at home or not watching a video what's great about this is Ian is is almost in a posture of resignation yeah He's leaning back hands on like his his stomach or his behind, you know, hands behind his head. He's letting, letting the, the, the distorted X-Men history wash over him. It's, it's really it's really kind of cathartic to watch. Oh, yeah. God, I love you. All right. Now, so Lorna for years thinks, okay, I'm not Magneto's daughter. She is. Okay. Now, in X-Men Volume 163, again, I'm just touching upon some highlights that Merck can jump in, of course, any time. Mm-hmm. Um, Magneto ends up in the Savage Land. This is where the, the, the Sauron appears, all those stories begin, Kazar. And he, he applies his abilities to, for genetic engineering, and he creates these Savage Land mutates. Mm. Murd? Yes. Um, well, first, uh, uh, he was – Magneto was showing his penchant for uh, playing dress-up here. This is something that he's done. Is this the orange costume? The, yes, okay. it is. It's that orange speed <laughs> suit with the fancy silver plumbing on the arms. Uh, and he calls yep. himself the creator. That's right. And uh, he introduces himself to Angel, who's part of the X-Men, who are right. down there on a mission. And uh, he's he tells him that he, he basically presents himself as like a benevolent uh, pellucidarian Professor X <laughs> down there <laughs> trying to identifying <laughs> Savage Land mutants in this and uh, bringing them together in a team the same way Xavier did with the X-Men. <laughs> when in truth, this creator was literally creating these mutates instead of finding them. He's picking up like uh, the fall people, like the, the, the primitive human tribes of the Savage Kazar's Land. Kazar's allies, yep. Yep, and he's experimenting on them to turn them into He's, I, I guess, identifying the X gene in them and activating it and turning them into mutates. And the team consists of people like the Frogman, Amphibious, and uh, the little shrivel-bodied but large craniumed uh, brainchild. That's right. Uh, there's the blind giant. Uh, uh, 
uh, Gaza <laughs> and the, the forearm giant Barbarus and uh, Piper who can control animals with the music of his pipe and uh, and the ultimate mutant well, well his ultimate creation to date Lorelai who has the, right. the power to overwhelm the minds of men but uh, Jean Grey being female is not impressed <laughs> but yes yeah, so this is this is Magneto you know, using disguise uh, in addition to his uh, his, his talent yep. for genetic engineering, and yep. uh, the the fancy silver piping on his arms is magnetic dampeners because his magnetic powers, if not thusly dampened, would uh, interfere with his delicate mutate making machinery. But that comes back to bite him because look, uh, there it is, Ian. Once again, that yeah, thank you, Ian. Almost wow. like a Flash Gordon type look. Yeah, it's the least amount of hair I've seen on Magneto's top of the head, too. It was the first time we've ever seen Magneto's hair, I think, because Angel mm. had never seen him without his helmet and so didn't recognize That's him. That's a good point. Yeah. Swap yeah. wings, spacefaring Magneto. <laughs> yep. That's going to look like Flash Gordon. Yeah. Good call. And I want to point out, if you're interested in, in a great Savage Land story with the mutates, Marvel Fanfare issues 1, 2, and 3 from the 80s. Maybe 1 through 4 now, I think about it. Claremont scripted Listen to the art lineup on this. It's first, it's Michael Golden. Then I think Cockrum comes in, and it's the X Men going back to the Savage Land, Kazar, Spider Man, and dealing with. I think the mutates are in it as well. So it's a really good Savage Land story. So yeah, Magneto's getting busy in the Savage Land as well. Now, Mer, anything you want to jump into before I go to Avengers one ten? Um. Oh yeah. Let, let me throw in uh, Fantastic Four number one hundred and two through one hundred and four ah, from uh, right. late nineteen seventy. John Romita Senior, I believe. Drew exactly. Was. And uh, this is once again um, Magneto trying to team up with Namor, and it went about as well as his first attempt. Yes. He wasn't trying to team up with him so much as usurp him and yeah. undermine his authority and manipulate Atlantis into attacking the surface world, so that he could then swoop in and claim the pieces for mutant rights or something. Yep. And he captures Sue Storm and Dorma and leverages them. Against the yes, and and uh, uh, John Burns' uh, X Men: The Hidden Years, which is an excellent oh, early two thousand series, it, it kind of bridges the gap a little bit between that Savage Land story you just mentioned yeah. in the uh, sixty two and sixty three of X Men and this Fantastic Four story. And Wait. also, there was uh, an appearance in Amazing Adventures number nine and ten, where Magneto did basically the same shtick, but he tried to usurp the Inhuman royal family instead. Look, of look at them. Ian has the image. Look at his costume. Yeah, that wow, that, do that I have to <laughs> <laughs> that oh, costume beautiful. that th I don't know what they were thinking with that one. That's that that's a special one. We're looking at the cover. Crazy, Fantastic Four one hundred and four. I think that's a looks like a John Romita Senior cover. I think it is. I think so. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, that's that's that is a. It looks like the murder they incorporated the, those that piping from the previous costume and put it on this one mm -hmm. essentially. And is it gray? Red, yeah. Blue? It, 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 no, no, it, it looks like it's actually like purple, red and blue. Yeah, but it, not not the like royal purple we associate with Magneto. It's more of a lavender. And it, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Does not work. I love costume oh. variations like this. And, 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 and of course, excellent uh, use of the uh, of the word bubbles on the cover. Attack me and those you love most will die. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> must stop us. We have no choice. The human race is at stake. God. Hey, wait, everybody we love is right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, I'm going to just jump into Avengers 110 and 111, Volume 1, so back in the Bronze Age. So Magneto is the villain in these stories, and he's going to use atomic devices to, cre to create an army of mutants from which he can then use to take over the Earth for mutant kind. I want to say the Black Widow was in the store with Daredevil, I believe. I'm not sure which I'm Avengers not... were involved at this point. I think so. Um, and the, so the X-Men and the Avengers team up, and they defeat uh, Magneto's plans once again. You, you, I'm sure you might be seeing a trend now that Magneto kind of does the same thing with some variation uh -huh. over and over and over again. He even manages to work a disguise into this. <laughs> he, he briefly dresses up as the angel to get the drop on the Avengers when they show That's up. That's right. That's and, right. And, 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 and also, what's his obsession with creating mutants using either gene therapy or bombs at this point? Like, I, I mean, radioactivity and the answer to everything. Come on. There you go. There you go. The angel's parents as gene stock for the, the mutants he's trying to build. Him. Maybe because Warren's really good looking. I, I don't know. Radioactive, radioactive. <laughs> now, we have to discuss, especially for Ian's sake, because I know he'll appreciate it. Oh, boy. Defenders issue 16. Uh, this is a sea change for the character. Murd, proceed. <laughs> oh, right. Yes, this this is the infamous age regression story. Uh, it's uh, 
I, I'd always assumed this was a Steve Gerber production, but it's, I guess, a little too early in the Defenders' run for yeah. that. So it was actually written by Len Wein uh, with art by Sal Buscema. And uh, this one, uh, Magneto has gotten back together a version of the Brotherhood, this time consisting of the Blob and Unus, uh, the Untouchable, Mastermind again, and Lorelei of the Savage Land Mutates. I guess that one was his favorite. And uh, he's deciding once again to try to create some mutants since the ones he finds out there in the wild keep disappointing oh, look him. At that cover. And yeah, that Gil oh, Kane cover. Shane, look at that cover. Those funky, funky eyebrows. Oh. <laughs> on Alpha, the ultimate mutant, because that's who Magneto creates this time around. And uh, kind of similar with the stranger, he, he he bites off more than he can chew. Alpha quickly evolves in you know, mentality and intellect and, uh, dis- and passes judgment on Magneto and his cohorts and decides that they're all just that their motives and their means are, are just they're like squabbling children. And he, therefore, he punishes them by literally reducing them to crying infants. And then Alpha, the ultimate mutant, takes off for the stars. Uh, rarely to be seen again. Yeah, I was going to say, is he ever seen again? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm sure Grunewald, uh, bring, of course. Brings, yeah, 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 Grunewald brings everybody. Into, right. Everybody who's ever been into space in the Marvel Universe, basically, showed up in his Quasar series eventually. Good point. So, yeah, the, we, we have not quite seen the last of Alpha, but this is the most important he'll ever be. Now, I want to po- go ahead, Shane, please. So he has kids. He makes kids. He becomes a kid. He becomes a kid. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Now. I want to point out first, Ian, I'm so glad you found this cover image. I mm-hmm. love the 20, 25 cent era Marvel covers. A lot of them are done by Gil Kane. Um, you've always got, you know, the, the 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 copy on the cover, the word balloons you mentioned. I love it. Plus, I always like to see Nighthawk. Kyle Richmond, right? <laughs> A character that, you know. Or as Hulk likes to call him, Bird Nose. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so th- this is a key moment, as Murd mentioned. So. When Magneto is reduced to infancy, mm-hmm. Xavier, who I think is in the issue as well, he turns him over to Mario McTaggart to take care of him and basically raise the child. Now, this serves a, a dual purpose now because now Marvel can now make Magneto young again because as they start to establish that he's been around since World War II, now Claremont can make him a man in his prime, and that's yeah. what they're going to do. So yeah. what was intended is just a silly throwaway story that ends with the villain being turned into a baby, and that becomes a vital continuity patch. Exactly. Well, and, and here's my and here's my thing: by by establishing the Holocaust, they couldn't do what they did with every other character and just say they fought in a different war. Because exactly. good point, good point. Yes. Yeah, there's no way of getting around it this time around. Yeah. Otherwise, he'd be in his 90s at this point if he'd yep. still be alive. So yep. Now. Very important retcon that came out of the story again to, to use merge that the patch that was applied by Claremont. So when we get and Ian, you'll know this because you read the story. When we get to the and Shane too, when we get to the classic X Men volume two number one that that initial mm-hmm. Claremont written story with featuring Magneto, where we learned that Moira was uh, uh, trying to fiddle with Magneto's genetic structure to keep his powers from you know killing him and, or driving him nuts. Right. So her goal yeah. was to, ideally was to basically create a different upbringing for eric or max so that he would ideally grow up to be a benevolent figure essentially now okay. of course, as we know from that story in 1991 x-men one one through three or four that when of course magneto realizes this he's enraged because he feels that she was tampering with his identity mm-hmm. uh, essentially and so, he has to question uh, every single action he's taken since his rejuvenation you know how much of that was him and how much of it was my moira's tinkering right so, so how does I, he remember all that it's revealed to him. It, uh, Shi'ar science. Yeah. Because it was Eric the Red who was a Shi'ar agent who re- okay. re-aged him to adulthood, but not quite as old as he had been before. Right. And, and, and that's one of the Eric the Reds, not the other Eric the Red or the other Eric the Red, but right. Eric the Red. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, I don't know why they took the Viking name, but uh, Eric the Red is the first appearance of the Shi'ar in, in X-Men, right? He's a Shi'ar intelligence operative. He is at that? He's on Earth. He's a covert agent. Yep, this is number 104. 104 X-Men 104, Volume 1. And he returns Magneto to his, his younger prime, we'll call it, essentially. So now we have a younger, more powerful Magneto. Now, uh, one of my favorite stories from this, this is now we're in the claremont Cochran burn era. So 104 is Cochran. Um, and then we get to X-Men 111. Now Byrne is penciling. Magnificent Terry Austin inking. Mm. And go ahead, Murray. Well, that says number 111 is uh, one of my favorite uh, lesser X-Men villains, Mesmero. He's kidnapped the all-new, all-different X-Men. Oh, and he's great story. He's uh, mesmerized them into thinking that they're su- circus performers, and he's just mm-hmm. taking them around uh, the country and making money off of them. Yeah. And Magneto 
rescues them from that, but it's kind of out of the frying pan into the fire because now that the X-Men literally his clutches, he's got uh, something uh, something even less pleasant yes. in a way for in store for them. At least they so, have their minds back. But so basically, Magneto, as Murd put it, and Shane, you'd love this. So it, like they have like Colossus, like the strong man. Sure. Um, Nightcrawler is like a circus freak. Mm -hmm. Wolverine's like like the animal in the, the cage. The feral man. Yeah, and, the feral uh, man. And Gene is a, like a slutty acrobat. Yes, like a, and and Scott is like the the uh, like the the roustabout. The roustabout. Like he's like the the the, the muscle of the yep. carnival. They call him Slim. Slim. Well, is that the first time we hear Slim? <laughs> oh no, actually no. he was called Slim Summers and just Slim right Summers right back from the beginning in the in the very first okay. appearance of the yeah. X Men. It's not for a few more issues that we learn his real name is Scott. Actually, yeah, that's right. So Magneto, they're freed. And they end up in this circus, uh, uh, like a wagon, and Mesmero collapses because they're ready to take him on. And then you, you in again, I missed the thought balloon. Scott thinks, "Lord, no, we're still nowhere near ready." And then Magneto appears, and um, it's a great Magneto story because Claremont is now really giving a lot more oomph to the character in terms of his power set, his grandeur. Um, the, the dialogue is more interesting that he's saying. And basically, as Murd pointed out, he takes the wagon into a volcano, which is live, but he uses powers to part the lava and he's built a high tech. I think I have an image, actually. Yeah. Ian, if you could show. Um, let's see. I thought I sent you this one. Magneto volcano, something like that. I think I sent you that. Image. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, hopefully this is it. But yeah. it could be. So is that it? Is that it, or is it, or is it a different one? That's it. That's so, it. Awesome. This, these are these are. It's, look at this burn art. So if you're looking on, on the, the the video, it's the X one being taken. Magneto's powers are ferrying the car the the wagon through the volcano. It's and the volcano, of course, is it, the the energy of the volcano. Magneto has harnessed it to empower this fantastically high tech base that you see on the, on on the YouTube video here. Again, beautiful burn Austin R from that that late seventies period that was so exciting to behold now in the story and Ma claremont's already been establishing since her first appearance that phoenix is manifesting her powers in ways that are unsettling and are are uh, of concern if not for the x-men then certainly for the reader and in the, she starts to fight magneto and magneto is being defeated and he's, he's thinking to himself i'm being assaulted on myriad levels physical and psychic by power that rivals xavier's but then Phoenix had kind of imposed like these unconscious dampeners on herself because with her power became too much. And one of these dampeners kind of like clicks in and then Magneto is able to defeat her. So the X-Men are then both in these like restraining chairs and they realize, and this is really actually quite creepy that their minds are intact, but their motor skills are reduced to that of an infant. Mm. So after Magneto spent some time having been turned into right. a baby, he's yeah. kind of doing the same thing. Exactly. This, this, this is this is this is vengeance, and he brings in this robot. He he calls Nanny. So again, Magneto's skills for robotics, and he basically tells the X Men, "You're going to be down here forever because Nanny will, will feed you, bathe you, attend to all your needs." And he, he basically says, "Like I couldn't think of a more perfect hell," and then he just leaves them there. And like Wolverine's trying to like speak and just like drools coming out. And, and it's really well done. Um, again, read the story to find out how they get out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's a great battle. But in, and then Magneto, he, he escapes, although he's the X-Men essentially defeat him. And he uses his powers to part the lava as he breaks out of the volcano. Go ahead. All I see is them at the circus. I want to be big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Name of that device again, the, mach the, the machine. Uh, Zoltar? Zoltar. I think Zoltar. And, and this, unfortunately, is not how we got the X-Babies. That was another story. Hmm. That was Lobo, wasn't it? Uh, but Mojo. Mojo. Mo Lobo. God. <laughs> <laughs> Mojo World. Right. Yeah, you bastard. So that was X Men's 111 to 113. Now I'm going to skip ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now is a good time for an interjection from. Yes. Her. Yes. I want to throw in here a uh, supervillain team up number 14 uh, and uh, a, a story you allu alluded to a little bit ago. Champions number 16. And when you said that Magneto could you. deflect yep. Ghost Rider's Hellfire, this was a uh, Magneto and Doctor Doom story. Uh, both of them written by Bill Mantlow and drawn by Bob Hall. And it's uh, Magneto called to the presence of Doom, who t tells Doom. Magneto that he's he's developed a mind control gas that's going to make him the master of the world. <laughs> and he, I think he wanted Magneto to have the honor of beta testing it. 
And sure enough, he's able to force Magneto to bow to him. And then he just kind of casts Magneto out and said, you know, good luck there. And uh, so Magneto finds himself having to team up with the beast of all people to try to, it's these two mutants against a world under doom. Uh, And somehow they're able to get themselves up from under Magneto's iron, I mean, from doom's iron heel. And we we, kind of get a first. There it is, champions, Superman team up from our 14, Mm -hmm. Levenstein again. Certain parallels between these two, not just Uh. the size of their egos, but uh, their uh, occasionally imputed uh, Romani Romani background. Zoom being yep. a Firo and a Magneto masquerading as one of the Cine tribe, I think. Well, well done, Merton. That's a burn cover there, by the way. Super villain team of 14. Yep. And uh, for another a hidden gem, also uh, contrasting these two characters, Doom and Magneto, uh, dig up X Factor Annual number four from <sighs> 1989, which has a backup story written by Ralph Macchio, but uh, drawn by John Byrne, <sighs> in which Doom oh, wow. and Magneto kind of, uh, they have kind of a mental duel on the astral plane where Ugh. Doom is trying to sound Magneto that. out as a, as a rival. And uh, yeah, it's good, uh, g- good character study in contrast between these two. X-Factor Annual 489. I'm sure I read it back then, but I don't remember. I'll have to get that. Mm-hmm. Yep. it's uh, the, the main story is like an Atlantis attacks crossover or something. Ah, but, yes. Atlantis but the backup, it, it's set right after the trial of Magneto. Which well would have done. made a flashback at that well time. Done. And before you move on to number yes. uh, X-Men number 150, uh, Uncanny X-Men number 125. It, it's just a brief interlude scene showing Magneto in a, one of his headquarters, Asteroid M perhaps, looking through uh, his uh, plans and his computer files to plan his next uh, campaign against the X-Men. But he accidentally comes across an image of Magda. That's right. Well done, Mark. And that well is the done. first glimmer well that done. Magneto has ever been anything other than this two-dimensional supervillain we've well seen. Done. That he actually has a tragic past. It's the first baby step in Claremont's <gasps> extensive humanization program. For Magneto. You know, I forgot about that, but I, I can picture it now. And that's why the X-Men were so great in this period, because they kept doing these little callbacks or the, or these just little cameo moments that are going to make me have so much meaning down the road. Mm-hmm. So, damn it, Bert. All right, well done. All right, uh, Ian, you can bring up uh, She is a Child, Uncanny X-Men 150, please. Okay. Now, this is a sea change for the character. So when Murd alluded to that brief interlude in X-Men 125, really comes to the fore in X-Men 150. So in X-Men 150, Magneto now has an island base in the Bermuda Triangle, which, you know, foreboding in itself. And from that base, he sends a message out to all the world governments, basically saying, surrender yourselves to me, dismantle your arsenals, because you're going to end up destroying the world, and I want to have the mutants fall prey to that. So they turn everything over to me, and you know there'll, there'll be peace. Magneto is always about you know, if if you follow along with what I want, there will be peace. He captures uh, Cyclops and Lee Forrester, or Letty's Forrester, who was a fishing boat captain, who Cyclops has been romantically involved, and he met her in, in some issues after the death of uh, Jean Grey. So they're captured. Um, Magneto doesn't harm them, but of course, being a you know a, a supervillain like he is, he reveals what he's going to do. And the, the X-Men are going out by both Boat and, and the Blackbird to try to find Scott and rescue him. And Xavier has a premonition that Magneto is involved. And then the Soviets, remember this is the 80s, so it's the Cold War, they send a nuclear attack submarine to fire missiles at Magneto's base. Of course, as we know with his magnetic powers, he, he renders them harmless and drops them into the sea. And that's it's a pretty graphic scene, actually, for an early 80s comic. He, he destroys the Soviet sub by shorting all its electrical components – and the crew knows they're going to die because the sub is now descending. It's lost all power, and eventually the, 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 the pressures in the water will crush the hull, and they're left with that, with that fate, essentially. Uh, then, he's, then he launches – he creates a volcano <laughs> to further get his point across in the Soviet city of Varenko, and he allows the population to, to be evacuated. Then he destroys the city, essentially. So basically saying, don't mess with me and give in to my demands. Now – the X-Men infiltrate the base. Uh, they free Scott and Lee, and a, a general battle breaks out. And it's a great battle. It, it's Cockermart, um, and they're going into how powerful Magneto is and how difficult it is for the X-Men to actually defeat defeat him. They all have to try to work together to do it. Um, but there's a, there's a key scene where Kitty – now, as you can see on the image, <laughs> Kitty Pride had many costumes. 
And she's wearing all of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is her. Let's call it her roller girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no. Don't mean to has to, to uh, make a Boogie Nights reference right, there. But right, right, right. But but th- there are roller skates literally yes. involved. And, and she designed this outfit herself. Too. <sighs> she did. Ian is Ian's right now. The cringe. It's fantastic. Uh, Look at those gauntlets. Come on. I think Xavier actually yelled at her for it. He does. He says you have to put on the the, the traditional student costume. Are you crazy, child? There we go. Ian, what do you think about that costume? Uh, I think that it's less of a costume and more like seven pieces of clothing layered on top of each other. (laughs) It's tremendous. So. In the battle, Kitty is now Kitty's still considered like a student at this point, but she goes into battle with the X Men, and they need to destroy the computers Magneto is using. Um, I forgot what what he's going to do. Some weapon that's going to cause all kinds of havoc, and she's able to use her phasing powers to disrupt the computer the, the computer banks. Magneto flies into a rage because. He's uh, that's the the computers have like all this data. He's accumulated his whole life that he'll lose and so forth. And, you know, he's fighting the X-Men. He's nearly killed Storm um, and he flies into a rage. And, and again, one of the powers you mentioned, he shoots an ele- electrostatic shock into Kitty Pride, seemingly killing her. And then uh, this this is this is a key page in the whole hi- history of the character. Basically, he realizes I've just I've just struck down a child. And then he starts to talk to himself about Magda and what happened and his own daughter. And Storm comes in ready to kill him. Essentially, he basically tells her, like, kill me, essentially. And uh, Storm is is, is stopping her tracks. He's never seen Magneto like this. And in fact, there's an earlier scene where he's sleeping in his bedchamber. This is great writing by Claremont. And remember, Storm was a thief as a child. Mm -hmm. She sneaks into the bedroom and his accoutrements are out from dinner, like a fork, a knife. And she's thinking to myself, I, if Wolverine were here, he would kill him. She said, I really should kill him. And she picks up the knife and she's thinking about like, God, he, look, he looks ironically so human. He's just sleeping. And then she's like, I can't do it. And then he wakes up and he just blasts her away and so forth. But in, the, in this scene, um, he's just overcome with grief at what he's done and what he's become. He sees himself really for the first time. And Storm does not kill him. She, she spares him. And then she just says to him, Give me my child, because Storm was like a mother to Kitty Pride. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's a very dramatic scene, and then Magneto vanishes, and Charles says, "Well, maybe, maybe he may realize now what he's become. Maybe he'll turn a corner in a sense." X Men One Fifty to anybody who's interested in the character's history is mandatory reading, because it's it, what Murd mentioned in issue one twenty five. That first glimpse of Magda, they really go for it in the story, and, and, and Magneto fully moves now from sort of you know run-of-the-mill supervillain to someone who's got a lot more going on underneath all that. It's a great issue. Um, and X-Men 1980s is, until they start to get a lot of the heavier crossover stuff, is just fabulous. And again, there was only one X-Men title. Uh, Ian. Ian. <laughs> oh, we're, we're getting there. Yep. Oh, I know. <laughs> He's got the New Mutants costume up. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Minus the gigantic M on the chest. <laughs> Thank God. So, uh, before we plunge please, any further into the 80s, please. I just want to bring up one more uh, semi significant 70s appearance. Uh, well, no one does it better than you. Uh, Kirby is here. Oh. Captain America Annual Number 4, 1977. When yes. he did his own continuity. Yep. Yes. The first example of Kirby doing Magneto without, without Stan. Mm. And yeah, you're right. It is kind of continuity light to continuity, not at all. Yep. And Magneto throws together his own new version of the Brotherhood of Mutants, aka Mutant Force, aka the Resistance. You know, uh, not very original characters. They're, they're just, their names were what they could do. You know, Burner, Lifter, <laughs> it's Shocker, etc. And something about two uh, a mutant who had two bodies, Mister One and Mister Two. It's it's I weird. Love there it's, it is. It's, it's cur- I love yes, there it is. It's so trippy. Yeah, but oh, reading this and, and contrasting that, uh, you know, what we were just talking about with Claremont and yeah. in X Men One, mm-hmm. even to what Stan, how Stan wrote the character. Yeah, it, it kind of casts into sharp relief what what each of the two, Stan and Jack, brought to their collaborations. Yes. Yeah, Kirby brought all kinds of fantastic visuals and ideas, but Stan mm. brought character. I couldn't agree more. Human voices, even if they were, I, I, you know crazy uh, supervillain speech making go ahead Ian 
No, I was just going to say, I'm also not quite sure what's wrong with Magneto's face. Uh, mm-hmm. And, 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 and I, I love, I love Kirby art. I just feel like something went wrong and I'm not sure what <laughs> it's, uh, it's very hyper deformed. Yeah, uh, he looks like he has like a, a, a donkey's face there. Like an elongated he, jawbone. Yeah, exactly. Well, let me have to remember also that late seventies Kirby, which I love is, that's a different era in, in his history as a penciler. It also yes. depends, remember he was also depend on who was inking him at different sure. times. So I, I'm going to, this is a guess. The inker for this might be Mike Royer from the late seventies, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, so that, that's a factor as we'll get, again, there are people far more versed in this than I am, but um, when you look at Kirby's history as an artist, you know, from the golden age, right through to, to his, his passing, you're going to see different periods and just the different approaches he's taking, techniques, different inkers, as he develops as a penciler. But yeah, this this is very much late seventies. There's the Kirby crackle, for example, and so forth. Yep. Yep. Good pick Mer. Good pick. The, the inker, the inker, at least according to the uh, Marvel database, uh, there's two inkers listed: John uh, Verputin and John Tartaglioni. Okay, Ver- Verputin was. He was called Jumbo John. He was the Marvel production uh, manager in the seventies. Very important mm-hmm. figure. He did inking. He died tragically very young in the in the latter nineteen seventies. Um, but a, a, a beloved figure in the bullpen, from all I've read. Now, okay, it's the eighties, Ian. Yes, it now, is. Now you tell me what crossover do we have to mention? <laughs> um, could it be uh, the X Men and the Avengers? And what was that event called? Uh, yes, that that is the trial of Magneto. Going to it, Magneto. it. Not before that, before that, before oh. two hundred. Uh, there's that giant freaking M. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that image. We're thinking 1983 uh, here, Ian. We're thinking action figure crossover. Yep. Oh, 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 Secret War. Yes, yeah, Secret Wars. Yeah. Now, I bring this story, and I was written by Jim Shooter, but I bring it up because Shooter does make an effort to establish that Magneto is not in the same category as the other villains. Now, Shane, you, of course, remember Secret Wars. I never read it. Shane. Never. Well, let's, everybody never everybody pause for a moment. Everybody pause. Yeah. Never. 80s, baby. I know. You've never read Secret Wars? No. No. Unless we did it on the show and I perused it there I once. I think we footnoted it, Shane. That like might have been issue by issue. Time. Yep. And I'm not okay. even sure that do I Do we have a copy in our library here? I'm um, sure we do because there's um Yep. Okay. Yep. Why well, yeah, courtesy of Matt's uh, library binding mania <laughs> of uh, earlier years. <laughs> I have the app. Yeah. Do you want to take this home? We want to read it on the app. No, I have the app. All right, it's got the app. We'll See. we'll look at it anyway though. So in this story, now again just a quick recap. The Beyonder who is, you know, a Marvel 80s cosmic being with his perm um, and his shoulder pads. <laughs> oh, that's Secret Wars 2. That's Secret Wars 2, I'm sorry. Um, he creates this battle world where he picks, he plucks key Marvel heroes and villains and puts them on this world, which is a composite of different planets, including, I think, Denver? Yep, a suburb of Denver. Where which ti- is... Titania is? Or... Yeah, well, yeah, the, the girls who will become Titania and Volcana, and also uh, the new Spider-Woman. Right, there. They're, all, conveniently, they're all there. So they end up in this battle royale, but the Beyonder puts Magneto with, well done, Ian, issue two, with the heroes who don't want anything to do with him, mm-hmm. and he doesn't want anything to do with them either, but the Beyonder felt his goals are more in line with theirs than the villagers. Again, I think it's an interesting way of Shooter acknowledging the place Magneto was taking as a character. I think mm. it's an interesting point. It is a good now, eye on Now, he kind of becomes like a third force. He sets up like his own base away from both factions. At one point, the Wasp tries to kind of like seduce him uh, to find out what he's doing and so mm. forth. That's something a lot of people forget, including yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Magneto does play a key role in uh, the Secret War storyline as well. Now, then we go to X-Men 200. Go for it. Go for it, Ian. X-Men 200. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Actually, can I interject a couple of Please. things first? Please. Uh, a couple of other important 1983 events. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, Magneto is his paternity of Vision of uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver is finally established concretely. They spent some time thinking that the Wizard, like the 1940s, That's right, the Wizard, Marvel mm. kindly hero, the, was their father, and they That's thought right. their last name was Frank. That's right. But then, in uh, the first, in the fourth 
fourth issue of the first Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries. Finally, Magneto shows up in Leonia, New Jersey, where Vision and uh, the witch had been living. And uh, Zen says to her, hey, guess what? I've, I think I've finally determined that I'm your father. And um, the, the, the twins are not too happy about this at first. But uh, by the end of the story, they're at least willing to hear him out a little bit and maybe give him a chance. But then we uh, jump ahead a couple of months to Avengers number 234, which was written by a different creator. This, Bill Mantlo wrote the, mm. the first Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries. Roger Stern in Avengers number 234 picks up where that left off and has the, the twins say, hell no, you're a monster. You abused us when we were in your little brotherhood. <laughs> we don't want anything to do with you. Get out. And so Magneto was very intolerant of the other members of the brother. He especially would beat on the toad all yes. the time verbally. Like oh, the God, mob yeah. wouldn't join because he felt Magneto was too bullying to the other members of the brother. Wow. <laughs> and when the blob has more empathy than you do, <laughs> you, you, you need to work on yourself. Too. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. But uh, things do get better between them because in the second Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries, Wanda invites him to Thanksgiving dinner. And he's also present at the birth of uh, Wanda's twins and prevent and protects Wanda and the twins from like, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Necra and the Grim Reaper who are attempting Necra. To, wow. to break in and do the harm. So that's oh a big development there. And one other thing that happened in 1983 that nice. I know you'll want to mention, X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills, oh. Marvel Graphic oh, Girl, number five, because yes. Magneto is a significant character yeah, in that. Chill. And it certainly yeah, humanizes him further. That like, We've mentioned that before. Have you read that story in? Oh, yeah, I love that story. Have you read God Loves, Man Kills? Yep, those of you who haven't, uh, a lot of X2, X-Men yeah, Striker, United, right. is loosely derived from that story. But in that story, which, again, that's one of the early Marvel graphic novels, it, stunning Brent Anderson artwork, uh, Claremont scripting, of course, but uh, it's it's the X-Men taking on a, a, a human supremacist faction that wants yep. to wipe out he's basically a, a televangelist yes. gone ethnic cleanser uh, the 80s televangelist. and his uh, group of uh, thugs the purifiers yeah and magneto gets involved and of course he wants to use far harsher methods against uh, uh ian just brought up a great page god you're clutch he's in <laughs> florida he's on vacation ladies and gentlemen still <laughs> still my machine gun belt is fed Ugh. So Matt Magneto calls on Charles to join him in dealing with the brutality of the purifiers, and Charles cannot take his hands. Dramatic moment. So they're further establishing these men are, are you know, they're on two different tracks here, essentially. But this is a classic. In fact, when Marvel did its that omnibus 75 years, 75 top stories, this is one the fans selected. Yes. I, I think I still own that somewhere, actually. All uh, all like the top 10. They released as, uh, as oh, in, 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 in floppy format. Yes, yeah. in floppy format. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well nice. done. All right. So after Secret Wars, in New Mutants issue 21, the, the character Warlock, not Adam Warlock, the techno-organic Warlock, mm. who becomes a key New Mutants character, he's plunging to Earth from – what was the name of this planet? Uh, I don't remember the planet's name, but uh, his race was the, the, the Phalanx or – Something like that. Yeah, or yeah, and his father was the Technarch Magus. That's or... right. That's right. And he destroys in his descent Magneto's space station. And he, Magneto plummets to Earth, his powers, he doesn't die, but he ends up in the ocean. He's going to be attacked by sharks. And Lee Forrester, the fishing captain, who we saw back in X-150, she comes by in her trawler. She rescues him. And they have become lovers for a brief period. So Claremont, because remember, Claremont's running the mutants too. He's starting to more and more add more dimension to this character, humanize the character more, essentially. And in X-Men 199, the Mutant Registration Act is passed. Uh-huh. So you remember what that was, Murd? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 there have been a couple of such acts yes. passed. Uh, but yeah, in issue number 199, it, Mystique and her uh, new brotherhood uh, – sell out to the government and rebrand themselves Freedom Force. That's right. And uh, they are the ones who bring in Magneto as a bounty. And uh, and, and this took place while Magneto and Kitty were uh, just uh, minding their own business, visiting the Holocaust Memorial, of all things. Oh, wow. So a little bit of bonding there between uh, the X-Men's two most prominent Jewish uh, members slash associates. So, Ian, if you could bring up um, Magneto at my Holocaust Memorial image, please. I think uh, the- Yes, I think Claremont I have that story too. So Claremont is further establishing Magneto as a survivor of the Holocaust and the impact that traumatic event has had on him. So once again, yeah, there it is. Is that it? Yep, yep. that's it. 
So, you know, he's talking about then Lee. He's talking to Lee Forrester's with him. Then Lee, it was the Jews. My nightmare has ever been that tomorrow it will be mutants. So, again, that haunted by the past, the trauma of what he experienced, determined to never let it happen again. Of course, that fine line Magneto always walks is by, by trying to prevent this horror from the past. He's only only he himself becoming a new horror in the future more correct ways of thinking is is it's happened once it's very possible it would happen again especially the mutants that's yep. 100 yeah and and, and it's another reason why i actually much prefer magneto as a an ally in one way or another to the x-men and rather than as a villain because even though their their opinions can be diametrically opposed even though their missions could not be quite the same, they're they're all looking to preserve the mutant race. Yeah, just different approaches. And, yeah, exactly. So I that's why like I just feel like he just works so much better when he's on their side rather than when he's against. Oh, Storylines are certainly exploring what you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so X Men Two are the trial of Magneto. So Magneto surrenders himself to the World Court because he feels he has to take responsibility now for. The crimes he's been accused. I remember Magneto was he sunk a Soviet submarine, he's destroyed cities, he's committed all kinds of acts of you know espionage and 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 you know stealing secrets, killed large numbers of people. I mean, you know, normal humans have, have a beef to say the least with this figure. Now he's he's actually defended by Gabrielle Haller. So the character back from 161, Claremont brings her back as his defense attorney. Xavier is there to support him. And for the prosecution, Sir James Jaspers, a name that should send shivers up the spine of anyone who's read uh, Alan Moore and Alan Davis's Captain Britain stories. Mm -hmm. Jim Jaspers, That's right. Himself an Omega level mutant. Uh, but, That's right. But one who hate mongers against mutants is kind of a cover. And he's he's insane and he has incredible reality manipulation and warping powers. Well done, Murd. Oh, but here he's just uh, he's just kind of a bastard aristocrat who's here to. You know, prosecute Magneto in the name of uh, you know, anti-mutant sentiment. Once again, Professor Murda's office hours will be posted, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, <laughs> Fenris, which are the Strucker twins, what's their power, Murd? Uh, well, whenever they're in physical contact with each other, they can produce uh, uh, destructive energy blasts. Yeah. And they are the children of the famous Nazi uh, Baron right. Wolfgang. So, so this goes, this is a call back to issue 161 they mentioned earlier in the program. They want revenge for their father. Fenris has, has, is also has like a terrorist group. Like they have foot soldiers and so forth and they attack the trials disrupted um xavier's or was this story in the john ramita jr period of pence and the x-men and um xavier is is already not well physically he suffered i think he was attacked at one point um so he's already not in great shape and this attack further harms him but the point where, he, where lalandra appears to take him back to shiar space because he's going to die and he needs the Shi'ar technology to live. And before he dies, he's, he's ferried away. Magneto's holding his arms and, and Charles basically begs him to take his place and take over the X-Men and the New Mutants and to make up for all his crimes. And Magneto agrees to do it. So this is a major change in the character's trajectory. So he's gone from, you know, world beating Silver Age, you know, twirling my invisible mustache, try to go with train tracks. I want to rule the world villain to, you know, more complex adversary to now he's going to be a mentor figure essentially so it, it's it's claremont's take on that character is a really fascinating arc and i find it very satisfying to read because it's it's over a long period of time it's not just suddenly oh he's good no it's 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 more involved and it's, it's i think it's the most rewarding reading experience of the whole x-men history for me at least can i comment on incredibly purple giant m costume for a moment bring uh, it up baby bring it up i wish you would <laughs> now uh, i i I appreciate this costume for what it is. I don't actually like it, but I appreciate it. Uh, I, I think that it's incredibly 80s. Uh, and it, it, like, especially in the, the missing like half sleeves uh, it, of it all. Like that's, that, that just completely makes it. But I like to believe the M stands for mutant and not for Magneto. That it's, he's not advertising here. You know, he's, he, he's, he's quite literally branding on himself an M for mutant. And very similar style to the M that would later appear on Bishop's face. Good mm. point. Yeah. And and Please. whether intentional or not, mm. I think that might be the direction that we're going for here. That that this is this is M for mutant, not M for Magneto. 
Right. So he's thinking perhaps subconsciously of that number that was tattooed on his skin at one point. Yes. Okay, hell, now Indeed. Professor Levenstein started his seminar. His office hours <laughs> are going to be posted. <laughs> well done, sir. Thank you. All right. So now we enter this period where Magneto is an ally of the X-Men. He's actually the teacher of the New Mutants. So yeah, for in, fully 40 issues of the yeah. New Mutant series from 35 through 75. And if you could bring up the uh, New Mutants group shot image, please. New Mutants group yep. shot image so the man rides out most of the 80s as the uh <laughs> uptight disciplinarian den mother of yes. these wacky little mutant kids wearing you know wearing suits and so forth but uh wearing the uh, black and yellow x-men uniform whenever he's uh you know in training sessions with the kids yes yep so and that's the characters merge said for quite a while now in the, in the x-men period now this is also the, when the Infamous mutant massacre occurs. Have you read that, Shane? Yeah. Which is a classic. I think one of the high marks, high water marks of the Claremont eighties period. And I mean, you know, was involved in that because he's he's living on the estate. He's in, he's a, an ally of of the X Men. And basically, Storm tells him, "Look, I need you to stay with the New Mutants because the X Men go underground." This is during the famous uh, Fall of the Mutants storyline, which I'm sure many of us have read. And in fact, the New Mutants and Magneto think the X Men are dead as well. And prior to the fall of immune, Storm encourages Magneto to actually accept an invitation from Sebastian Shaw to join the infamous Hellfire Club. Mm -hmm. This is where Storm is acting as a much more Machiavellian leader of the X-Men because they're desperate. They've just been attacked in their home. People have been killed. Uh, Nightcrawler's in a coma. Colossus is stuck in his armored form. Kitty's stuck in her phasing form. So Storm is like, look, we need the resource of the Hellfire Club. We need to know what they know to help us try to navigate these, these very uncharted waters we're dealing with here. So they form that relationship. Then the X-Men seemingly die uh, in Fall of the Mutants. Now, before that, uh, there's the famous, and I've mentioned this story many times, the FF versus X-Men miniseries from the 80s, which I think is a, one of the Claremont's best works. And it, quickly in that story, we've talked about it before, the X-Men their desperation go to Doom to help Kitty because Reed has a crisis of confidence and he can't. And uh, Magneto goes with them. And there's a key moment in the story at the end where everything's all as well. Kitty's been healed it's a, it's a great story one of the best versions of doom i've seen in terms of how he's characterized and manito actually goes to re richards and apologizes to him for some of his conduct during that adventure and reed says you know the magneto i knew never would have done this so even in that mini series claremont is furthering and advancing this character's development which is great mm -hmm. Might as well interject here that at the, about the same time as that ff versus x-men there was also x-men versus avengers that's right which, That's right. Uh, I think it was written by Roger Stern. I believe so. Yes, and it provided some resolution to the whole trial of Magneto thing. Which, yeah, you know, they never really rendered a verdict in that trial right. because of Fen Fenris's disruption of the whole thing. So, yeah, so yeah, I, I think uh, Magneto was issued a pardon. I've read that story since the '80s. I don't recall, but he, I think he does leave it ultimately in, in a decent position, if I remember correctly. That's also technically the first full crossover between the X Men and the Avengers, right? I mean, outside of you know, like a, a character or two appearing. There, there wasn't yeah, like the one. Yeah, the in, in those Avengers issues we talked about back in the Bronze yep. Age. It, it happened oh. a couple of times. Yeah, but, yeah. but this, this is a like a miniseries dedicated to those two teams. Right, right. Busting over the eighties, yeah. there was a lot of great miniseries that Marvel produced. I mean, Wolverine's one of the most famous, but there's a whole slew of them in the eighties. Now, yep. in X Men two fifty three, Magneto finally decides he's rejecting Xavier's way. He returns to Asteroid M. He's kind of like. Washing his remember, uh, temporarily, uh, the new mutant cipher is killed in a mission, and Magneto wasn't there, and he, he's he's really affected negatively by that. Um, oh, I think cipher's alive again, right? Well, Everybody well, who alive. isn't really, yeah, <laughs> yeah. go in that technology, yeah, yeah but, but, but poor Doug stayed dead longer than most. He did, he was extra, he was shot, and so Magneto abandons his charges, he goes back to asteroid M, um, to kind of like dwell in isolation and seclusion. And then, Ian, if you could bring up um, the image entitled Rogue Confronts Magneto. Okay. So Rogue Confronts Magneto. So X-Men 273 to 275. So this is now what Jim Lee is on the book. So we're nearing the end of Claremont's run on the, the, the flagship title. And in the story, Rogue has lost her power. Remember, there was a period of time, and Claremont emphasizes in the 80s, that Part of Carol Danvers' psyche was in Rogue's head because when Rogue stole Carol's powers. So there's moments in the 80s period where 
Carol kind of takes over Rogue's body, even though there's a, or there is a Carol Danvers walking around, mm -hmm. but she was flying around in space, right? But she, as binary, but she was psychically traumatized by Rogue having, holding on to her too long. So part of her psyche is in Rogue. So at a period of time, Rogue loses her powers. She ends up in the Savage Land. Magneto was there as well, and they established there is definitely an attraction between Rogue and Magneto. And they, they follow through with that in different ways in the years mm -hmm. to come, especially in Age of Apocalypse, right? Too. Um, which we'll talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. But call back to the Bronze Age period, Zaladane, so the sinister high priestess of the uh, petrified man's cult or whatever it oh, was. The cult of Garrock in the Savage yep, Land. The Garrock cult, thank you. She is still there and she's fighting Kazar and the Fall People. And she's trying to steal Polaris's and Magneto's powers. And in the ultimate battle, uh, Mag Magneto, he, he executes Zaladane. And in this, in this uh, box you see here on the screen, Rogue is horrified by the violence he's using. And he says, you know, she says, Magneto, that's murder. And he says, no less than they had planned for us, Rogue. That's classic Magneto. Yeah. That's classic Magneto. Like, if, you're, if, if I have to use violence, I will, essentially. So that, that's, that's a really good late. Claremont era story. It's Jim Lee, um, his period on the book. We're not going to mention here in detail because we mentioned before, but X Men two sixty eight, the classic Cap Black Widow um, Wolverine retro story back in World War two is which is a classic. I think they've done that. Have they done that as a cartoon too? I feel like they have. They kind of did. Yeah, oh. they, they, and and, they, and they've done it like I think on multiple series if I remember correctly. It's a, it's a great story. It's from this era, the, those issues. Yeah. So then we go to Acts of Vengeance. <laughs> Captain America 367, and they finally address the fact that Magneto really wouldn't be a natural ally of the Red Skulls. The Red Skull is an unrepentant Nazi from World War II. So in that story, he entombs the Red Skull alive as mm. punishment for his war crimes, mm. essentially. So yeah. any comment you want to make on that? Uh, well, just to, uh, to throw in there that Magneto, as uh, one of the prime movers of the Acts of Vengeance event, you know, and the uh, the gimmick there was that a bunch of like a cabal of major league Marvel baddies uh, came together and decided to try to dispose of their arch enemies by b changing dance partners, basically you know, having uh, villains attack heroes that uh, they had never previously fought. And uh, usually these prime movers didn't get directly involved in these shenanigans. They just stayed in their hidden war room and just dispatched uh, cat's paws and henchmen <laughs> to do their dirty work. But uh, Magneto actually went out into the field. Uh, to, to battle Spider-Man in uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 327 um, because uh, right. Spider-Man had just developed his cosmic the spider cosmic ability. powers yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so uh, he Magneto made his usual mistake of uh, here's a powerful person he must be a mutant I must go conscript him to my cause and so that's basically what he was trying to do until he ascertained for himself that uh, no this this is not a mutant ability that Spider-Man's developed he's got too damn many powers yep. he's too powerful this is something else happening I'm just going to leave <laughs> And entomb the Red Skull. And entomb the Red yes. Skull, exactly, which is the more significant of the two yes. stories. But well, but yes, uh, that, 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 though, thank you for that. Eric Ian. Larson, that's, that's Eric Larson. I, my favorite part is that on the very cover, it says the non-mutant cosmic superhero. But <laughs> <laughs> he faces the X-Men, X-Men in bold, you know, what print. Numbers, what number is that? It's 327. That, 327 from mid-December. Because that's that that's back when they were doing two weekly, months. right? Yep. yep. God, As a kid in that. 1989, oh, that would have been that. tough to resist. Yeah, I'd love that. Yep. I, I, yeah. I had I got all of it. All right. <laughs> so this leads us to the culmination of Claremont's run on the X Men. So this is a uh, X Men Volume Two, Number One, the highest selling comic book of all time, issues one through three. So in the storyline, Jim Lee artwork. Magneto has built his new orbital base entitled quite grandiloquently Avalon. <laughs> And he built it out of stolen bits of Cable's spaceship, just to that's right a extra background. And he's going to live there in seclusion. He's just he's just washing his hands of the whole mutant human war. And a group called the Acolytes, there's that classically image, who basically worship Magneto as like a messianic figure. They seek his leadership. At first, he's not interested, but the leader of the Acolytes is a guy named Fabian Cortez, who's this sinister, double dealing uh, opportunist. And he uh, worms his way into Magneto's uh, uh, base, and Manu ultimately agrees to take on the Acolytes. And the, the world powers are nervous that Magneto has this vast base orbiting above him because of what's happened in the past. Inevitably, the X-Men get involved. And this is where Magneto 
realized that Moira had tampered with him, his genetic his genetics when he was a baby, when he was in, in her care. So he he flies into rage about that. He uh, captures her. He uses that the technology she created to actually try to control the X Men actually during the battle. Ultimately, the X Men are, are Triumph and Magneto. Actually, Magneto basically tells Charles, "I'm going to stay up here with my alkalites, and we're going to die basically because because Avalon's going to plummet into Earth's uh, gravitational pull." And he basically tells Charles, "You know, we're going to go to our deaths like tigers." And, and again, Claremont clearly, clearly uh, delineates the difference between them. Although Magneto st is still sh is affectionate with Charles as he speaks to him, like in a mental communication, as Avalon's plummeting the Earth, and you think Magneto is killed. And that's that's the end of Claremont's run on the X Men. And, and and I'll say this is this is when the the nineties uh, interventions of editorial were at their finest mm. because you could tell beyond a shadow of a doubt, and it's not just because he left the book. You could tell beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was not what Claremont wanted to do. Mm. Um, that 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 he firmly believed, and he said so in interviews since then as well that that Magneto worked better as an ally than he did as, you know, evil Magneto roar. But <laughs> Jim, Jim, Jim Lee wanted him that way because Jim Lee, uh, you know, wanted, wanted a villain uh, Magneto to play with. Um, and at the time when art was more important than story, they decided to go with, with Jim Lee on this one. It led to tension with Claremont. Claremont left the book. Jim Lee then left the, then left the book, and we were left in this like nebulous period where you kind of didn't even really know who Magneto was for a while there, because there was no one to dictate who he was, um, and it was it was a really interesting time because the X Men was never more popular, and yet oh, God. <laughs> and yet and, and yet I felt like Magneto was never less formed in those early stages. Well, it, it was it was a really weird time. It is, and you. you you described it well. We'll jump into that sort of transitional period. Um, I would imagine, based on what you just told me, I mean, you got to think about Claremont's been writing the X Men for fifteen years, yeah, consistently. And I, I can only imagine, as this veteran who basically created this entire world that they're now making billions of dollars on, um, in these films and 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 all the other multimedia and, and Lord knows what's to come. But I I can imagine as a veteran. I, I'm guessing he must have been chafing at them, being, them telling like, look, this is what you have to do now with this character. You basically essentially he created. I mean, he didn't create Magneto, but he made Magneto into what he, he, Gave him the he is. Yeah. So the depth of the character. I can imagine his frustration now from a reading standpoint. I love those three. Ian, that, that's your first experience with X-Men comics. I, I, for the most part. Yes. Uh, as, I, as a I, kid, I, how did that affect you? I mean, it was it was awesome because, you know, I was I, I, at the time, you know, super duper into them because of the animated series and what have you. And then I went back and I and I, you know, sought out the sought out the, the books. I had the uh, the full fold out poster version of X-Men number one, which is still on that. my on the wall of my childhood bedroom to this very day <laughs> um, with the Reserve proportion like with the with the proportions that made absolutely no sense. It was great. Um, but bedroom. Uh, <laughs> but but still, I, I I loved it. But looking back on it now, story was a problem and story was a problem for a while there until I'd say until Nicieza started writing the ship a, a little bit later on. Um, and really started giving the characters voice again. But yeah, it was basically just, hey, we have a successful animated series. Let's try and make the comics an animated series. Um, and, you know, for, for, for good or for bad, uh, that's, that's what we had there for a bit. Well, and, Go ahead, Shane. And, and to add, I, I, I did the same thing. I jumped in with issue number one, but also Uncanny X-Men with the gold team, because at this point, they're splitting up into two yep, teams, that's right? right. Yeah. So I was in. I was very interested in following two books with two separate teams as my first main exposure to X Men comics, and that's mm -hmm. that's what started me reading. I went backwards a little bit. Yeah. But from here forward, for years, I read X Men. That's interesting because having grown up reading, so when I first started getting an X Men, I was a early teens, and I, I got a lot of the back issues and, I, and a lot of classic X Men. That caught me up on the whole Claremont Cockrum Burn era from the Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. So I was well versed in that. And then, of course, one of the first 
uh, trade paperbacks ever got was a, a 1980 reprinting of the dark or an 82 reprinting of the dark Phoenix saga. Mm -hmm. So I was well-versed in all that. So, and I read Claremont throughout the eighties. So I remember I found this nineties stuff very dissatisfying, even as a younger reader, because it was so, as you said, Ian, like the tone, the style was so in contrast to what I had been reading for the past, you know, decade. It was a it was a typical transitionary period, yeah. you know, because like uh, like I don't think Marvel quite knew where they were going to go, and with all this success and with all this you know boom in the comic industry, they weren't even sure if they had to go anywhere. Yeah. But then they firmly understood that well, we got to do something, and luckily they had people like Nisi as a who knew story, who knew plot lines, who knew you know, what they wanted to do with the book, which then brought characters back a bit. Um, and, and it really, it really started to change things as the nineties progressed. And let's, let's perfect piggyback. So Nietzsche, as it does X-Men, uh, I think it's in volume two, number 25, the Magneto protocols, mm -hmm. which is a part of the fatal attractions yes. crossover with all those yes. nifty holograms on the That's covers. right. The holograms yep. covers. Oh yes. So Magneto, the, the governments, the world governments activate a network of satellites that are below Magneto has another orbital base again. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's Avalon. It's Avalon again. again he, yeah. he, he reassembles, he reassembles it. it, yes. And it, it it prevents Magneto from using his powers on Earth or descending to Earth. But he lets out an EMP burst. And they allude to the fact that he's basically just killed hundreds, if not thousands of people. It's airplanes fall out of the sky, hospitals shut down, etc. So the X-Men go to the base to stop him. And this is where he, the, the infamous scene where he rips Wolverine's adamantian bone, skeleton right off his bones using his powers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Charles then shuts down his mind, puts him in a catatonic state. But uh-oh, because that'll lead to a psychic blending of Xavier and the rage of Magneto, which will lead to who, Ian? Mm, Frickin' onslaught. <laughs> <laughs> Now uh, and frick he did and Einstein. Oh, yeah. I almost said Einstein. Ian's brought up the page of Wolverine's adamantine ripped off his bones by Magneto in uh, issue twenty five of Volume Two. When when they finally did that, when they did that in the comics, even as a kid, I was like, "How did this not happen yet?" <laughs> <laughs> because because you know magnetic magnetic powers, adamantium metal magnetism. It just makes well, sense. I remember there was a classic what if prior to this in yeah. the 80s where I think it's called what if Wolverine had killed the Hulk mm -hmm. and he ends up joining the X-Men and, and Magneto uses powers to have Wolverine basically kill some of the X-Men and stab himself mm. essentially something something like that is one of the what ifs. So it did happen in the what if. So you, you're, not, yeah. you're not totally off guard there, honey. Off base. No. I was curious about some something in my own history. So I looked up um, Amazing Spider Man issue 289, June 1st, 1987. Is that the Hobgoblin? Hobgoblin. The Hobgoblin quote reveal. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's one of the first Marvel comics I picked up at a 7 Eleven across from my aunt's house. Oh. I would have been 15, 16. The next Marvel comic I picked up, like I read all the Spider Mans from mm. that point on and some crossovers with other Spider titles. But the next things I picked up for Marvel were X Men number one and Uncanny what two eighty one was it at the same time with the Gold Team that was two eighty uh, one I think you're right so it was two eighty one I think before that it was all DC so yeah. so this Spider Man few years wow. and X Men were my first introduction to Marvel mm. and then years later meeting all of everybody at Golden Eagle yeah. and by extension all you guys that's what exposed me to my Marvel reading so it's it's only been since like 96, 97 that I read so much more Marvel. It's still over 30 years ago. Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but, but there's still so much more to read that I missed out yeah, on. So we do these, honey. Yeah. Okay. Now, just a quick reference off to the side. After these events, the Age of Apocalypse occurs. Oh. That's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> oh, you better believe it. In fact, I would, I would love to just earmark that we should do a spotlight on. I'd love Age to. At some point, but I'd, I'd love just, to do Ian. I was thinking the same thing because I have not yeah. read those stories, and so I'd love to read them all again and then just talk about them. Absolutely. Um, we but could call it a book of the month. Yeah. The, oh, oh, good very point. Long book, but uh, <laughs> still, <laughs> better get done radiant black first. But AOA is a great idea. Absolutely. But, um, 
just quickly. So basically, in Age of Apocalypse, Legion and his fragmented mind decides the best thing he can do for his father is to go back in time, kill Magneto. So then his father can then pursue his dream without Magneto trying to stop him. But when he goes back in time, he forgets to calculate the fact that his father and, and, and Magneto were friends in that time period. So Charles actually sacrifices himself to save the Magnus of that time period. And simultaneously across the cosmos, the m crystal fractures. Yes. And that leads to Legion. Instead of splitting off a parallel timeline or alternate reality, it alters the mainstream timeline. And we end up with the Age of Apocalypse, and a world without Xavier. Yes. And Magneto is now essentially a, a leader of rebellion against Apocalypse. He's adapted essentially Xavier's vision. He's with Rogue. They have a child. Um, anyone who has not read these stories, mm. if you're jaded on crossovers, don't be with this one yeah. because this is a really I, would you agree this oh, is a yeah. really well done crossover it's, it's it was well done a daring concept yeah. and they executed it very well now so age of apocalypse i think offers a really interesting well it's one of the like one of the ultimate what ifs i mean it, yeah. it's more than a what if because of what they do with it but you know seeing magneto in in essentially an xavier role in this dystopian future where it's you know and the age of apocalypse is brutal a lot of people oh, die yeah. in it i mean yeah. like the stakes of it are incredibly high because and some of it had ramifications in the x universe after it was over well because nate nate gray crosses over mm -hmm. uh, beast, along with a few others Ray beast uh sugar man sugar man sugar man and the imposing figure known variously as holocaust or nemesis yes yeah. apocalypse's son right it also it also winds up negatively affecting bishop because you know bishop oh yeah bishop knew everything right. and I, I think it kind of eventually leads to evil bishop later down the road but you yeah know. He, he was basically the psycho pirate there he was the only one that remembered everything yeah. he was wandering around in that yep. for years right with like a fragmented memory mm -hmm. exactly so, yep Ian's right. We got to we got to do a, a proper uh, praise reappraisal of that story. Definitely. Okay, now we're getting into the weird area where <laughs> I admit I'm not as well versed. I mean, I've read a lot of these stories, but I only read them once. And I, again, as I said earlier in the program, I've come to realize recently, just doing a lot of rereads, that the post Claremont ah, that's the classic Magneto World Silver Age story. Well done. Mm -hmm. the, yep. the post. Claremont era of X-Men I'm hit or miss on like some stuff I like some stuff I'm like what the hell is this um it, it just a lot of clutter a lot of team ups a lot of crossovers it's it just not as fun for me but there 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 are nuggets in there for me as well but so Uncanny X-Men 327 the first appearance of Joseph oh Magneto's boy it was clone oh yeah now this clone the first time we see Magneto after uh, the age of apocalypse ends he's still a vegetable He's on Avalon, but then uh, Holocaust slash Nemesis, who crossed over from the Age right. of Apocalypse reality, destroys Avalon, sends it crashing down. Colossus tries to rescue him, uh, but they get separated in their descent to Earth somehow. Colossus, Colossus is an alkalite at this point. Yeah, by yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. He had turned yeah. during the uh, fatal attractions. He defected to the alkalites. Because yeah. his, when, when Alanya was killed by the legacy virus, he was mm -hmm. so traumatized by that. Yes, he didn't think the X-Men did enough to save yeah. her, so he yeah. decided to ad adopt Magneto's extremism. But yeah. then uh, they, they fall to Earth. Colossus lands in the Excalibur title, where he becomes a member of that team yeah. along with his ex kitty pride and I mean, magneto's body just goes missing and then next thing we know joseph appears right and he shows up in uh, this like catholic orphanage or something in guatemala yeah. and <laughs> one of the children there names him joseph after you know, saint joseph the surrogate father of christ and he's much younger than magneto had been yes mm -hmm. oh, he, ian found him already <clears throat> there's that 90s hairdo yep oh yeah is that joe majura art that is that is definitely Joe Mad Art, yeah, uh, and I believe that's Maggot standing behind him. No so way. yeah, wow. yep, uh, yep. I don't miss these stories at all. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> what you don't mean that you don't mean you don't miss the Crimson Dawn story, which no. was literally created just to put a red mark on Psylocke's face. No, that's it. Oh, I I enjoyed the Joseph part until the reveal of what he was. And I'm like, oh, okay, another clone, I, huh? Yeah, like the mystery I, was cool at first, but. Eh. Wah, wah. Considering that we had already de-aged Magneto once, mm. I I I was kind of hoping that this was just like that they were either going to like create some sort of recursive loop where like what happened to him is just going to keep happening over and over again due to gene manipulation or something <laughs> that would have made that would have made more sense than what we got it, it, not for another freaking clone okay as somebody who survived the clone saga over over in Spider Man. <laughs> Like, we didn't need that in X-Men. We did not. 
right there with you, Ian. And wasn't yeah. didn't they retcon that Astra was behind Joseph? Yes, yes, okay. yes. It was yeah. largely a creation of Alan Davis, who had uh, okay. kind of stepped in as a uh, writer and co-plotter of a lot of the X Men stories at that point. But yeah, yeah this was when it was the Magneto War story, which happened in 1998, I think. I uh, so. Start of 99. Yeah, that's where we find Astra steps from the shadows and she's like, hey, um, he, she was the you, know, you mentioned her about an hour ago, Chris, as, yeah, a, did. as a Magneto's original Recon recruit for the, the Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Yeah. But she, you know, bugged out or he kicked her out or something like that. But so to get back at him when Magneto's comatose body was tumbling from Avalon, she snagged him and then she cloned him. <laughs> well, well. Yeah, first she had to heal his wounds to make his you know, genetic material clonable again. Right. So, uh, And then she started to clone him and create this younger Magneto for some vengeance scheme of hers that never quite bore fruit. Because at that point, Magneto, the real Magneto, woke up, yeah. burst out of her headquarters, and uh, Joseph escaped at the same time. And so she kind of lost track of both of them. And so Magneto and Joseph dies later, doesn't he? Well, yeah, this yeah, is again yeah, that's during yeah, the Magneto War story. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's the Magneto War special, yeah, which yeah. was right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah. So Magneto went into the shadows and did his own schemes. Uh, he popped up for the first time since you no, know, uh, no, no, since Xavier stole his mind yeah. and, and and created Onslaught involved uh, unknowingly. And and Onslaught actually happened in the middle before all of this. Yeah, in back in '96. Uh, but uh, the Magneto, disguise, again, his penchant for playing dress-up, he shows up as another Eric the Red. <laughs> and this is in uh, Uncanny X-Men numbers 349 and 350, The Trial of Gambit. That's right. And uh, uh, yeah. Oh, more he's the prosecutor. He kidnaps the X-Men down to the uh, to Antarctica again, to his old headquarters, as seen in... The Volcano Headquarters. Right, yeah. right, where, where they were held captive by his nanny robot. Yeah. And uh, as Eric the Red, he... Uh, uh, he, he's kind of the inquisitor to Gambit, reveals his role in the, the mutant massacre story, and also says mean things about Joseph, whom he said would be next on his hit list. But uh, the X-Men break free before he can get through all that. Angel says to him, yeah, Eric the Red. Nobody's Eric the Red. It's, it's, it's just a cover identity <laughs> handed around like an old hat. So <laughs> Cyclops was Eric the Red once. So That's who the true. hell are you? That's true. But yeah. the X-Men yep. leave this uh, encounter. They, they abandon Gambit to die in the X Antarctica. And, and Ian and I have talked before about how that's maybe a wee bit out of character just for a little bit involved yeah. yeah oh yeah while eric the red flies away and uh just chuckling to himself aboard his craft he puts on the magneto helmet and we know oh okay joseph must not be the real magneto here's the yeah. real deal and then that whole thing is paid off in the magneto war storyline and as you said chris the two magnetos fight and joseph dies yeah, he yeah. Uh, he's ra he's aging rapidly because yeah. that's what happens to clones apparently, yeah. and uh, he he sacrifices the rest of his magnetic life energy to heal the damage done to Earth's magnetosphere during his battle with the real Magneto. Yeah. Exit Joseph. Right, and yeah. at that yeah. same moment, enter Doctor Alda Huxley of the UN, who offers Magneto <laughs> as appeasement. Genosha. Okay, so yeah. Now, now, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Seven. Good. Be 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 before before we get to Genosha, because I know that that's a huge part. I, we didn't really get to touch on onslaught that much, and I really want to just like nope. get into the insanity of it all. Um, <laughs> well, that could be now, its own episode too, really. Oh, oh, I know, I know, and I'll be I'll I'll be quick on it, just because onslaught was like right in the thick of like when I was following Marvel comics, like like every single issue I was trying to buy back then, um, and I know that. Uh, you know, he was the combination of the psyche of both Professor Xavier and Magneto. What was the most intriguing part of all of this is that they try to retcon that Onslaught is the traitor that Bishop was sent back in time to prevent. And it, it, not only did that just make no sense at all uh, in, in, in the in the overall scheme of things, it also kind of in some way did because, of course, who's the ultimate traitor in this situation but Xavier's fractured psyche himself? Who can destroy the X-Men? Professor Xavier. We're kind of already seeing that a little bit in what's happening with the Krakoa stuff, but that's beside the point. Um, but it was it was interesting that like this was Magneto and Xavier at the same time, yet at the same time, neither one of them. Um, while Magneto was off being Joseph, but no, he wasn't. He was off being Magneto. We just didn't see it until he was Eric the Red. It's just it was a it was a very strange time at Marvel. It then led us to you know heroes were heroes return were born and heroes return heroes return the better of the two of course. Yeah. Um, but it it was it was kind of also an end of an era when you think about it. Um, in Marvel comics, that it was it was the it was the end of the 
combined 90s and 2000s to me. Like, I don't consider comics after that to be the same as what they were pre onslaught. And Magneto was part of that because when Magneto's psyche was absorbed by, by Xavier, this set this whole thing up. And then we got onslaught. Two points. Uh, first of all, the best thing about onslaught was that it brought us the Thunderbolts. Oh, absolutely. Um, and the other thing I always love about this story, because I'm not a huge fan of the role, but there's, there's that moment where, I don't know if it's Nichese, Nichese or Lubdell, one of them, pulled a panel mm-hmm. from an early Lee oh. Kirby Silver Age story that was never referenced yes. again. When Xavier's yes. thinking, 30 thoughts thinking, about Jean oh, Grey. if only Jean yes. only could tell her how I feel. Like It's like, what? Yeah. And then they yeah. do nothing with it at all. Yep. And I, 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 I got to give them props. They go back into 1963 and pull this thing out to yeah. show how he, that there, there's there's corruption going on in his psyche essentially so yep <laughs> man oh man it was an interesting time friends it was an interesting time so genosha yes oh, one last thing about joseph i i should uh, mention Please. that uh, the, the first ever magneto uh miniseries uh, the first ever mm-hmm. you know t- starring magneto title that that marvel ever published it actually starred joseph Yes. Not the Magneto. That, ah. that was published the second half of uh, 19, well, at the very end of 1996. It was written by Peter Milligan, no less, Good with art by Kelly Jones. Wow. So you, you can bet that that uh, lobster claw thing on Magneto's helmet got a little longer and prettier <laughs> for that miniseries. Yeah. Okay, yep. now, getting back to Genosha. So X-Men Volume 2, number 87. Um, Magneto seizes the Earth's magnetosphere via the North Magnetic Pole. He basically blackmails the Earth, saying, telling the UN, if you don't give me a control, like a state wackiness is going to ensue okay so they seed genosha to him now we know that claremont created genosha great storyline i want to say the art was by sylvestri that sounds right um, one of those image types so where genosha was basically apartheid south africa hmm. oh yeah and that's the analogy and it was it was a a, a human minority trying to control a mute majority and the, the x-men end up there and and they overthrow the um the high engineer. Yeah, the government there. Yeah, whose last name happens to be Moreau, as in the island of Well Doctor. done, yeah. And, and so then Genosha now has this tension between humans and mutants. And Magneto takes control and he makes it into a mutant haven. He, th- he, he eliminates whatever remaining human control is there. He takes power. And for the next, I don't know, couple of years or so, he's ruling Genosha. Like right. We did our Black Panther Storm on Drang storyline. We did our movie review of last month that's when he's the he's the he's the head of state of genosha right now up there rubbing shoulders with uh, namor and t'challa yeah, and doom. doom yep yeah there were a couple of uh, mini series that got out of that magneto rex and magneto dark seduction <laughs> <laughs> he brings quicksilver into the fold he brings polaris into the fold mm-hmm. as like his chief peacekeeper yep. rogue shows up as you know like the long-suffering love interest to try to talk some sense into yep. him mostly her standing around wringing her hands and tearfully saying things like i can't believe the man i love would ever <laughs> and finally she gives up and leaves yeah, and eventually, I love when you go all antebellum on us, man. <laughs> I'm getting a case of the vipers. <laughs> yeah, and in Dark Seduction, the Scarlet Witch and the Avengers show up, and then also try to remonstrate with him, and uh, also nothing comes of it there. But at the Super. end of that miniseries, he finally uh, kills that snake in the grass, Fabian Cortez, okay, right. for the second time. Mm-hmm. All right. And so Magneto continued to preside over Genosha until the Eve of Destruction storyline. X-Men Volume 2, 135. That's the Grant Morrison period, isn't it? Uh, well, no, th- this yeah, is actually yeah. what happened right before right that. Before that. Okay. Yeah, because his, his hold on Genosha was starting to slip a little bit. He had got he had captured Xavier and was threatening his life, I yeah. think. So the yeah. X-Men, well, Jean puts together like a, a team of leftover mutants that she just kind of cerebroed over to the mansion and, and Dazzler randomly showed up. And I so she that. I. I love this storyline, and I think it's one of the one of the storylines that is the least like known because it's right before Morrison, right? And and I I thought it was a great ragtag group of mutants that quite literally never showed up again. It was great. It was great. I completely agree. Yeah. I, I'll I just, have to read it again. I read it. I just out. love that Gene you know, put together these factory second mutant. Like they, they, there was a, a, a Cargill of the acolytes who she had to telepathically compel to help out. Yeah. Like, yep. Forcibly altered her personality for the purpose. There was like this big, like, uh, bouncer guy that came along, and, and a guy who was just like a, a, a tube of uh, a sack of guts with transparent skin. <laughs> Wasn't Cargill the woman who was involved with Xavier? Uh, no, that a... that's uh, Vote. You're thinking that was there. one of the other. Amelia okay. Vote. Yeah, was Cargill was 
she was known as Frenzy, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, they storm Genosha and they meet up with uh, Cyclops and Wolverine over there and they manage to take down Magneto and Wolverine just puts his claws right through him and seemingly kills him. And we don't really see what happens to him after that. And then we jump from there from this. I agree with Ian underappreciated Eve of Destruction story, which is also like Lobdell's exit mm. from the X books again. And is that when the Sentinels yeah. attack? Uh, well, Genosha? yeah, right at the beginning of New X Men. Yeah. That's when you know Cassandra Nova right. and her yeah. Sentinels come in and just wipe. They, things were bad enough in Genosha they as it was, but killed uh, virtually everybody. Right? Yes, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, very near. Not everybody, everybody, but very nearly everybody. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't like that new run at first. It took me a while to warm up to that. Yeah, you and a lot of other people, but there are just as many other people who thought that what Morrison was doing was brilliant. I think there's stuff in there. I, I have mixed feelings about it. There's yeah, stuff in there I, I like, stuff I don't. I agree with both. The, games, yeah, honestly, yeah. There, there's there's plenty of stuff. There's plenty of stuff I enjoy. There's plenty of stuff that I don't. Um, I actually did not enjoy the fact, and I mean, we're about to get to it in about two seconds anyway, so I might as well say it. I did not enjoy the fact that Zorn was actually Magneto. Huh. Um, I, I I thought I thought it was a, an interesting swerve, but pretty much the exact minute that I, that it happened, I thought to myself, "Oh no, they're obviously going to redo, you know, undo this because oh Zorn yeah. was, Zorn was too good of a character, yeah. and 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 it was it it was Marvel's nature at the time, unfortunately, to try to hold on to things long past their due point, and I could easily see them, you know." Sweeping that under the rug and being like, "Not nah, Zorn was real," and then they tried to do that. Yep, and so they did. Yeah, yeah. They, yep. they went the evil twin route, yep. so that it turned out that Zornito, as he came to be known, <laughs> this uh, the this faux Magneto that uh, uh, revealed himself to have been Zorn in disguise, uh, and you know took over some of Xavier's students and wrecked New York and uh, killed Jean Grey ag again, again, but for real this time yeah. in. New X Men number one fifty. Yeah. Um. It 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 was later revealed that this was this Zornito was the evil twin of Shen Zorn, who was a member of the X Men. Well, well, he, he would become a member. Like Shen Zorn yeah. would become yeah. a member of the X Men. Yeah. But this guy who joined the X Men, uh, disguised as Magneto, disguised right. as Shen Zorn, was actually Quan Yin Zorn. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The evil twin of the good guy Zorn, whom the X Men had not <laughs> met yet, and then they had to go and find the real Shen Zorn somewhere and bring him into the X Men titles again and, for and, the first and time. And Wolverine beheads the yes evil Zorn, right? Yeah. Yes, he yeah. does. Yeah. So we think at the time that he's beheaded Magneto, right? right. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. But that Sarah doesn't last more than about five months because then mm. uh, Claremont comes back to the fold in he the, does briefly. a new volume of Excalibur, which is yeah. set in Genosha, and it's Xavier. He's there to you know, pick through the wreckage and see what can be salvaged. And uh, Magneto just kind of shows up. And, and he's of, angry that anybody thought that this guy in New York was actually him. <laughs> of all the Claremont returning to X-Men moments, which have happened because he has a lifetime contract and that's what he's allowed to do, um, is I, I actually really enjoyed that run of Excalibur. Uh, even though it was not Excalibur and should have been named something else, I agree because it because it did not take place in in the UK, nor did it involve any of the characters. Um, I I I liked the whole post Genosha rebuilding process of both Xavier and Magneto. The interaction between the two of them and in, in, in that was great, mm -hmm. and some of the characters that they introduced in it were actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, way better than extreme X-Men when it comes to Claremont. And what's also interesting about that, Ian, is that there's, there's, there's a growing movement that's captured by the the, the uh, model. Magneto was right. Yeah. And you see like almost like he comes like a Che Guevara type figure, like he's like his images, like more mutants are starting to embrace his way after after the annihilation of the, the mutant community in Genosha. Mm -hmm. People are like, well, maybe we should be following what Magneto has always said. So that, there's that interesting element that's brought into it again. Again, that debate, you know, manifests itself. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, I mean, the the more is an era. I mean, what do you what do you think about? It? You read all that. Well, so I, again, I did not like it at first. Yeah. It took me a good year to then go back and reread mm -hmm. that whole first year all at one shot mm -hmm. to sort of appreciate it a little bit better. And then I then I read the rest of it and enjoyed it. But it it, it took me. A, I'm pretty sure at least the whole year. Of that fur of his first twelve issues to really mm. get into it, because I I was like eh. there there it is, yep. First first worn by uh, by uh, uh, what's his name? I, now I'm not blanking on his name. Now all of a sudden the uh, the, the, the oh uh, he has like purple hair 
He's a he's a psychic. Uh, oh, Quentin Quire. Yeah. Kid Thank you. Quite, you got it. Quentin Quire. Yep. Yeah. Quentin okay. Quire was the first to support that. Mm, that 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 figures. Now at this stage of our checklist, I have to admit we're going to cheat a bit because yeah, not only because it's getting late, but also because we're entering an era now where I'm not as well read mm-hmm. in these stories. I mean, I've read some of them, but not others. And Magneto, depending on who's writing the character. Right. He's kind of buffered around in different directions, but certainly since since the the destruction of Genosha, the whole Zorn thing, like Magneto is Magneto. Now, I mean, some things to touch upon. First of all, House of M, Mm -hmm. which is a major event in the history of of mutants in in, in Marvel. Yep. Um, So Wanda, again, going through the grief and trauma of losing her children, um, which is a recurring theme, of course. They, Of course, they touched upon brilliantly in WandaVision. Um, She creates this new reality where. Magneto's house of M. Magneto's family rules the earth, right? It's, yep. it's a centric society. Um, and you know, I'm not going to go into all that. It's a whole other story. But basically, at the end of it, uh, Wanda is so caught up in, in, in what all, all that's happened, what her father has done, and so forth, her trauma, her grief. The heck of it is that Magneto wasn't really the bad guy in all of that. No, it was, it was, her, it was Quicksilver. Quicksilver who, He's the one who whispered the idea into her. Yeah, ear. She was the one who motivated the whole thing. Doesn't Magneto kill? in quotes, Quicksilver at the end or something like well, that? Well, tries to, but uh, yeah. you know, since none of this is really real anyway, right. it's, so, know, he, Pietro easily survives it. So then she does the the ominous whispering, no more mutants. Yep. And you have the decimation where almost all the mutants on Earth are, are depowered. Mm-hmm. And yep. Magneto was one of Magneto's them. Magneto's one of them, yeah. So he has to deal with that. Um, then there's the Avengers versus X-Men story where Charles is, is killed. Oof. All the phoenixes, all of them. All phoenixes. <laughs> Magneto was not one of the phoenixes. No, he was not. He's involved. I think he sides with the X Men in that against the Avengers. He does. Yeah. And 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 one of the one of my favorite arcs uh, of the time was Utopia, uh, and and that is that is Kieran Gillen's. Uh, There's some good on stories in that. Yeah, there really are, and it's kind yeah. of a precursor to Krakoa when you think about yeah, it, because absolutely. it's when yeah. it's when the X Men had had a a base off of San Francisco, yes. yep, yep. Um, which uh, basically becomes a mutant home, and that's where Magneto really starts siding with Cyclops's side of the of the entire thing, because while this is all going on, Wolverine has the Wolverine school, sorry, the the Jean Grey school. Uh, back that was in Western. Wolverine, Wolverine and the X Men. Yep, yep. That was a good title. That was, a good that was title. Jason Aaron. Yeah, that was really, was good. really, really good. Yep. Yeah. So, right. Wolverine's continued like the school part of it, right? When then Scott yeah. has created this haven. Yeah, Scott's created the haven over right. in San Francisco, and and dealing with that. It's also when we get one of my favorite uh, Magneto variants oh, of the his white costume. costume. Yeah. I love the white costume. Yeah, um, good one. I think I think it's striking and. It works just about as well as his as his original one, honestly. Like it's all it has, the helmet, honey. It's all the helmet. Yeah. Oh, ab- yeah. absolutely. Yeah, but uh, but it's it's a good color combination for what he's working with. And to take the character, and again, we're just kind of cruising through. But up to the last few years, really, is the Krakoa Power of oh. X, House of X stories. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, where Magneto and and a resurrected Charles Xavier come to terms we've all read these stories to some degree i, I, haven't, I haven't read the most recent ones but yeah those first few arcs i thought were some of the most exciting x-men I, i've said this before in the program that i've read in years oh yeah yep um mm-hmm. it's jonathan hickman again it's kind of like morrison that he's doing something totally different with the characters while still being true to their history taking them in in a, in a very interesting new direction challenging many of the of the assumptions we have about the x-men their place in the Marvel universe is what they're doing actually heroic or is it more about you know self interest and power politics? It's really interesting stuff, and they form this council, which you know Magneto sits on, Mister Sinister, Apocalypse, because the idea is all the mutants are going to come to this island, and of course they have this new resurrection technology, yeah. so they can save their consciousness, so no one actually dies. Yeah, and basically it's Charles and we'll, we'll call him Max now, who have come together to try to realize this. This this mutant nation that where where Genosha you know collapsed, um, and I, I didn't know that we talked this off the air, but in the last few storylines, Magneto has died. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in the X Men Red series, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what the thing with their Martian colony, I believe they yep. set up. Arako, yeah. they call it. Yeah, and yeah, written by Al Ewing, I'm pretty sure. Which I'm sure it's good. So I have not read that story. 
Um, forgive my cynicism. I'm sure he's not really dead. In, in, um, they'll they'll figure as out as you've just said. Death means less to the X Men now than yeah. it ever has. And so that's, that's yeah. means something. Have you read that story yet, Ian? I haven't read that one yet. It's on my list, but I I, I did want to just read these lines here that I have up on the screen, please, from, from early in the Krakoa arc that I think really epitomize Magneto down to a T, and especially in this day and age. Um, I've spent my life fighting so you would never have to, my child. I've wasted too much of my life at war with the humans, but it was worth it because now you have Krakoa, and Krakoa is all you will ever need. That, that's a great pick, Ian. That's a great, that's, uh, Levenstein. Great pick. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. to go back to Shane's point from earlier on in our discussion, that's that quote is a perfect example of how Magneto is the complicated character. Yeah. Yep. Who you can you can understand his perspective, where he's come from, especially when you know what forces created him and his strategy, his tragedy and, and, and his suffering. To finish out our comic force discussion, wonderful quote to end with. Well done. Well, Thank you, sir. Yep. Much much appreciated. And honestly, I there's been so many Magnetos over the years, and it's just the one that cares is the one that I prefer. You know, not not the one that that seems like he's just out to get everybody, but the one that just wants wants his people, wants the best for his people. Yeah. Yep. And and that and again, that can lead him into some very dodgy areas when it comes to yeah what he's doing and and can he, can it be justified again? But when, with his mentality, it can. Yep. Um, but the, it was some of the most invigorating X Men comics I've read in years. Yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right. As often the case, we do a little bit of other media to end our discussion. Mm-hmm. It has a fairly sizable other media footprint, mm-hmm. actually. I feel like we've already mentioned half of yeah, it. Yeah. So we yeah. talked about his his early appearances in cartoons. Yep. We're in uh, two in 1981. Again, the Spider-Man solo series, episode six. When Man- Magneto speaks, people listen. And then from Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, episode seven, also from 1981, the prison plot. Mm. So this is very... Silver Age Magneto, like oh yeah, you know I'm gonna if you don't let me get, get my people out or I take over the world, I'm shutting down your power, right? Th- that type of thing. I um, mean, again, I loved hearing the GI Joe character actors, by the way, because it's all the same production yeah. company, right? Yeah. Sunbow, Sunbow. We mentioned uh, X Men, Pride of the X Men, the 1989 pilot, which I've yet to see, which also features him. And he, why don't you talk about a little bit about why the X Men animated series is so important to you? Uh, it 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 got the X Men right. Uh. That even even though it was set, you know, clearly in the '90s, mm-hmm. it it managed to uh, to do versions of so many pivotal X Men yep. storylines sure and just convert them to an animated s- scene. I still think it's the best retelling of the Phoenix Saga ever. Uh, even though there were some changes, it, it it got as close to the story as you could possibly get in in animated form. And I would and, say. Even though the animation's a little under par for the time, mm-hmm. the animation itself wasn't so great. But the stories were awesome. Oh, yeah. And Magneto yeah. played a key role throughout the series, did he not? Mm-hmm. Very much so. Uh, all the way to the end. Uh, he was always there in one way or the other. They did the whole Savage Land arc, which was great. Um, they even had some Rogue and Magneto stuff in there uh, at times. So they address some of the complexities of the character then. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Very much so. And it, it concludes, even though that last season is complete trash, um, the, 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 last, the last episode is actually pretty moving. It has Professor Xavier essentially dying and Magneto pledging to take over from there. So it's very similar to... 200. All right. To X Men 200, and now they're going to be continuing that series. I said they're, they're bringing um, it back along X Men 97, right? Yep. They are, and it looks like Magneto will be in that leader role, and possibly even in the M outfit. So wow. we'll 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 see where that goes. And sort of to piggyback that, Hasbro in this last year has started to produce action figures it's based on the this. animated series. Uh, yep. The new one or the old? The old one, yeah. which will I'm sure lead yeah. into. New when is that airing? The new series. Um, I think it's this upcoming year, if I remember correctly. Okay. Yeah, they haven't given a, f- a firm date yet, but uh, but yeah, that's 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 definitely uh, going to be happening soon, and I and I and I can't wait. And the last thing I want to mention, of course, is just a little bit about the movies. Mm-hmm. So oh yeah, two actors, two great actors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Magneto a different. So Ian McKellen, Sir Ian McKellen, playing you know old you know Holocaust survivor Magneto. Then we have Michael Fassbender. 
playing Magneto Young in the 1960s through the and the 1970s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What do we what do we think of their portrayals when we think about the characters captured in the comic? Varying. <laughs> We're all speechless. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that uh, Ian McKellen does a, does an excellent job of of getting the personality down right. Yes, um, and. And that first scene, you know, of, of you know, where we see the, you know, the, the back when Magneto was young at the ho- in the Holocaust scene, which has been reused in multiple movies now, yeah. um, I think is, is absolutely excellent. Uh, Michael Fassbender, another excellent, uh, terrific actor playing the role, but a lot less consistent. And mm-hmm. quality is the problem is that it, it's all in the script thing. Exactly. Well, yes. for example, um, I couldn't agree more because we've talked about this many times. The X Men movies, I think, I know many of you agree, are very uneven in terms of their oh, yeah. quality. Yeah. Um, but like Days of Future Past is a just a fantastic interpretation of Magneto. That's, that's my favorite. Yes. Um, yep. When he has like Mystique, like in the phone booth, like, yeah. his, like, like they're having their confrontation. Yeah. Um, it's the best written of a lot. Certainly. Yeah. And then like the next two are just. Oh, they're terrible. I, I and, really thought yeah. Days of Future Past, it would continue to get better because they thought, wow, we've really hit a high point now yeah. for this new X-Men franchise to continue. And whoo, boy, yeah. that crash and yeah. burn quick. And, and, and that said, the, the characterization then suffered because the writing wasn't great. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I love Fastbender when they did when they did um, First Class. What's that? First Class. The First, first class. class. Like I love how they developed the Xavier uh Eric relationship there that was well done. Well, one thing mm-hmm. that's always troubled me about that one, though, yeah. I mean, talking about inconsistent writing. I mean, yeah. I like I liked where they were going with him for the first part of the movie, all the mm. way up to the climactic scene where yeah. Magneto was primarily just this uh, fringe dwelling, you know, <laughs> Nazi hunter, basically yeah. just mm. out for vengeance and nothing more. Then he finds that damned helmet <laughs> and he puts it on and suddenly, oh, I think I'm going to be a mutant demagogue now. Let me go out and collect my cult followers. And it's like, it's just a true. very sharp <laughs> left turn for the character from that, that point on. And, and Murd, that's a very good point because that was a problem with all those movies is that they all they all felt the, the desire to reset Magneto yeah. at the end, at, at either midway through or by the end of every <laughs> single one of the movies, that every character growth he had, eventually he would wind up falling back into ger arg uh, <laughs> and, and especially with the Fastbender ones, like Apocalypse is has its moments, but then it's really bad in other parts, and <laughs> Phoenix is just almost that's unwatchable terrible. yeah it's terrible it's just yeah. a movie they made because they could yeah and i i agree yeah. i mean magneto it, the interpretation is mixed because the writing is very mixed i think in those oh movies. yeah now yeah. last thing we'll talk about how do you anticipate them using the character in the mcu because he's going to appear eventually impossible to even speculate yeah all we can I, say for sure is that as long as there are x-men there will be a magneto yeah. appearing along with yeah. him and i have and i have high hopes for that for how how MCU's track record has been and what yeah. they've brought to the table and how they've mm-hmm. woven stories together that they might actually do it really well. And I hope they do, mm-hmm. but they have a it, lot to try and mm-hmm. make up for. Have you heard it's, of casting it, rumors, Ian? Nothing yet. Uh, Cause they really haven't been talking that much about, you know, who the X-Men are going to be. Cause we're probably still a few years away from that. I feel like, but I want him to be, Especially if they wind up introducing Doom and and giving him Latveria, I want Magneto. Oh yeah, and, and I want Genosha. Yeah, it's a good point. Yep, I I think it would be perfect. To we'll set up that great Doom. geopolitical yeah. dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, a- absolutely. And, oh, so and, and anymore, you got Wakanda. It's it's all ready to go. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. One one hundred percent. That's that's the place where he should be. Um, I'll also point out just because we're talking other media. Some of my favorite times that Magneto has shown up has been in the versus games, the uh, Marvel versus Capcom games, <laughs> uh, as as he's been a central figure in X Men: Children of the Atom, uh, Marvel versus Capcom Two, Marvel versus Capcom Three, and he's been a playable character in all of those. And they use his he, they use his powers really well uh, throughout those. So uh, nice to see he's been he's shown up in multiple video games over the years, and they've done a good job with it. Brethren, as always. This has been a tonic for the spirit. <laughs> Indeed. Any, yep. Do you have any closing comments on Magneto? Our bolt has been shot, Our bolt but, it's, been yeah. shot. but it's hovering magnetically in midair. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my final comments on him, uh, 
love to see a Jewish character, love to see a, 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 a respectful interpretation of somebody who's gone through, you know, what he's gone through. And it's another reason why I prefer a, a Magneto that's kind of on the side of good rather than an entirely on the side of evil is that he's dude's gone through a lot. Just get, thank just you, give it. Thank you, Chris Claremont for that. That's, that's all Claremont. Amen. All right. Yep. Shane. All right. There we go. I'm ready. I'm ready, ready, ready. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready, ready, ready. <laughs> Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com to send us an email. The address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. Stop by thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com. Let us know what you think of Magneto and your favorite spots. Follow us on YouTube at youtube.com slash comicgeekspeak. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who contributes to the episode. Send in your model to Merz. We'll need them in the future. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. You got it on Wednesday, and you were psyched about it going to the volume up. These guys will talk about it, everything the geeks love. Who cares to laser beams, opinions like the seasons on everything you read in comics, movies, games, toys, artists, comics. Come on, 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 come